call the meeting for Wednesday, September 30th, 2020 to order. Uh, first order of business would be the consent agenda. And I have, uh, well, first of all, I have to say, Jennifer, just reminding me and I already forgot, but Hadley Media is down currently. The internet is down at the Goodwin. So uh, this is going to be recorded and then uh, rebroadcast tomorrow on Hadley Media but people are able to join in live on the Zoom link. So we're, we're good for open meeting purposes. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. Uh, consent agenda. We have minutes from April 2nd, 2020. Warrants AP 2113, AP 2113S, AP 2114, AP 2114S, PR 2106, and PR 2107. We have the appointment of Carolyn Brennan, the new town administrator, to the American with Disabilities Act coordinator, public information officer, chief procurement officer, capital planning as a non-voting member, and the uh, financial management team. We have a request from Hopkins Academy Cross Country for the use of the town common on October 1st um, and November 3rd. Third. Looks like there's two Octobers there, Jennifer. Is that correct? Yes. Did I write the wrong date down? I have October 1st and November 3rd, and then it just says October. Okay. And is there, there is a third date. It's, okay. Let me just pull the letter up and I'll tell it to you. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll continue on. Uh, we have a DPW snowplow on call list authorization to create that. Uh, we have the request for a Highland Circle dead end sign. Um, it says stop sign, but it's actually for a dead end sign uh, to reduce some of the turnaround traffic we're getting on Highland Circle. And then uh, also the November 3rd warrant for the 2020 state elections approval of that warrant. And do you have the other date there, Jennifer? I'm having some technical difficulties opening okay. my file folder on my computer we'll right now. We'll come Is back the, to it. So I'll put um, I think she can just share the date with us, but we can approve it. I'm sure there's nobody else using it at that time. It was a third October. Go ahead. I was just going to say it's another October date. It is. I believe it might be the 20th or something like that, but I can send it to y'all just as soon as I get that file open. Okay, but we'll approve those three yeah, times. Motion, motion, motion to approve. And I just had one question um, uh, for discussion is about what, what the time is or what is the uh, on-call list for the DPW, if that could be explained to me. Yeah, okay, so we'll pull that out. And then uh, we have a motion for the other items. I get a second. 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 Okay. second. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 And then, uh, so as far as the DPW snowplow on call list, uh, this was actually something that John Wiskavitz, uh brought up that used to be done in the past. Um, the DPW had requested to hire a contractor to augment um, DPW staff for extended snow events, um, you know, or if there was a shortage of, uh, of manpower. And we looked at the numbers, it's not something that we can afford to do at this time. So what we're going to do is put out a request for townspeople who would be interested in plowing snow in a per diem capacity. And they would be plowing using town vehicles subject to a driver history check, quarry check, and whatever HR requires. Um, they will be used second to union employees. So we're not taking anything from the union and it'll be used to relieve, you know, 30 hour snow events when the guys need a break to get off the get off the road. And it'll be paid, I believe 18 to 23, Chris, is that the uh is that the salary range for the bottom of the union? Uh yes, 18 to 23, yes. So okay. the hope is we can save some money compared to the you know, 40 or 50 dollars an hour in time and a half the union guys are getting. Mhm. Mm Okay, I just wanted that clarified. I'll make a motion to accept the DPW on call list. 
Second. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. And uh, Chief Mason, are you here just for the trunk or treat? Uh, yes, that's correct. All right. So I'm going to slip this in real quick so you and uh, Officer Barini can get out of here. Um, I'm sure Trevor won't mind that. So do you want to talk about uh, trunk or treat? Yeah, uh, thank you. I'll, I'm just uh, really quickly, I just want to introduce uh, Jake Marini. Uh, on my screen, but he's probably somewhere else with, with everybody else. Um, and I see Jenny is on the, the meeting as well. Uh, she's hugely important to this, uh, this event. Uh, Jake approached us um, a couple of weeks ago and presented us with this idea that, you know, that people have done this before. I'll let him explain exactly what they are, but kind of a way for, you know, to do some uh, community building, especially with the police department and community and offer, um, you know, another alternative to potential trick or treat, um, you know, uh, for you know, kind of a, a different option. Uh, we immediately uh, reached out to Jenny because Jenny has run these events before, all kinds of events, obviously. And we're working with the fire department as well. So we've turned it into a public safety and park and rec combined event. Um, Jake uh, and Jenny have done a lot of work on the plans for safety protocols. The Board of Health has uh, taken their first glance at them. I, I think we still have some, some work to do just to make sure that uh, we're we're, uh, you know, making sure that we're doing everything as safely as possible. I think at the first blush, they've uh, given us a kind of a go ahead to move on to the next phase. And Jake and Jenny can kind of take it from there and just quickly explain what a trunk or treat is. And then they have a, a request for the board. Yeah, so the, the plan was to create an event that was safe and an alternative for people who do not want to participate in the traditional trick-or-treating. We were planning a drive-through trunk-or-treat event uh, October 30th from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. utilizing the town commons. Um, we created a whole proposal and had COVID-19 guidelines which were approved by the Board of Health and they gave recommendations which we have implemented and we actually are exceeding CDC guidelines in terms of COVID-19. So the point, the point of the event would just be to provide the community with an alternative to the traditional trick-or-treating that is safe and follows all COVID-19 guidelines for those parents who are weary about sending their kids out to do the traditional trick-or-treating aspect of it. I have a question. Yes. Um, so you want to use the town common and I'm just wondering how you're going to set that up. But is it going to be on the north side, the south side? Are the cars going to be parked on the edge? Are the kids going to be in the center of the town common? Um, the other alternative I was thinking of would be to park uh, in the parking spaces at the uh, elementary school and have you know the trunks open that way for trick or treating, you know, on a paved highway and, and it's off of a traveled road. So I w wondered how it got to be on the town common and where, how you were going to set that up. Yeah, so we uh, approached the elementary school at first to use the parking lot and they initially approved the idea, but then they had uh, some concerns regarding potential parent backlash because the school isn't really open and they're hosting this event. So then we explored other ideas which turned into the town common and the idea would be that cars would park at the edge of the town common on the south side where the asparagus festival is usually held. And mm -hmm. kids would, nobody would be getting out of the cars, everybody would be wearing masks, and candy would just be handed out in sealed packages to kids in, in vehicles so that everybody can keep the social distancing and contact can be kept to a minimum. Okay. I, you know, I don't yes, have... I think I think, I think a lot of it also may have to do with how many uh, participants we have as well. Uh, Jake and, and Jenny already have what like maybe 20 or 30 vehicles that want to participate. We actually have some businesses in town that have uh, earned uh, multiple hundreds of dollars in donations of candy to do this. So um, a lot of the setup may have to do with 
you know, kind of total number of folks involved. Um, but we're going to use so what, precautions. So do, you, so do you think that there's going to be an outside amount of towns around us that will come in and participate in it also? Uh, that, that definitely has the potential. We haven't even started marketing yet, and we already do have interest, like uh, Chief Mason said, from businesses and people willing to participate. Mm -hmm. Um, so as soon as we get approval, if, if we get approval for the use of the town commons and we start marketing, there definitely is potential. Um, we are thinking right now we will have 100 families and we'll, we'll get a better idea about how many people will be attending once we start the marketing and get interest in the uh, Facebook event page that will be created. I'm, ju I'm just thinking I'm being proactive because, yes, we can participate um, if you live here in town, which as you know, there's a lot of trick-or-treaters from different areas that will be dropped off and trick-or-treating around town, not, not necessarily, but this is what has happened in the past is people from out of town would come into the residential areas and, and participate, which, you know, that's part of Halloween. You expect that and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just concerned about the amount that you might get uh, when you start advertising. So I have no problem with it. I think it's a great idea. I think it's a good alternative, but just something to think about if there's if any possibility of outside people participating. Is there, is there any way that you can, um, in all of your advertising, say this is for Hadley residents? And yes, a few people will crash, but in general, you get the message it's not public. Can I speak to that? Um, I just, we have to be careful on saying Hadley residents only because if we do advertise it, uh, especially for our school population, we do have a lot of kids that are, um, you know, school choice and they're not from Hadley. So if we shut them out, that shuts out a big portion of our kids that we normally advertise these events to. So we just need to be careful on how we word that um, and, and not letting our, our kids in, even if our quote unquote Hadley kids are school choice kids that live in surrounding towns like Sunderland or Amherst or Northampton. Well, somehow maybe it could be worded to be um, kids who attend the Hadley schools. I know then we have kids in town that go out of town. So that's another issue. Right. Um, I think it's a great idea. I'm also wondering if the select board in conjunction with this should make some kind of a statement that says, um, Given COVID-19, we're encouraging families not to go trick-or-treating this year. And instead, through the public safety, we are offering this option. I, I, would, I would defer to the board on that. Um, I'm not gonna... I, I don't have a problem with advertising it as an alternative. I don't know that we should say we discourage or encourage actual Halloween. I mean, it's a, it, it is what it is. Every family, every person treats it differently. It's like, you know, we, we can't go out there and say we, we cancel, I don't know, 4th of July. It, it, people are going to do what they're going to do. So we can say we encourage you to participate in trunk or, trunk or treat, but I don't know that we should say we discourage Halloween. I mean, you know, the, the governor put out guidelines for doing actual trick or treating, which are pretty reasonable, basically what wear a mask, social distance, that kind of stuff. So I would imagine you're, and especially in the, the neighborhoods, you're still going to get a good amount of people out and about. So I, I don't know if we want to say we're discouraging it at this point. We're not discouraging. I, I think we just want to make people aware that they need to still um, certainly uh, follow COVID-19 precautions. No matter what you do for Halloween, you still have yeah, to follow yeah. those. Whatever That's you do, you have to follow precautions. I just think giving out that warning is, is, is a good thing. Yeah, I think there was a flyer maybe that Board of Health sent around or at least some guidelines. So we could, you know, stick that with trunk or treat or whatever uh, as far as on the event page. So, um, so what are you looking for? Just uh, approval to use the common? Is that what you need from us? Yeah, they, we're, just, we're just looking for approval to use the common so we can go and go forward with the marketing. Yeah, okay. I'll make a motion to approve the trunk or treat and um, bring before us the final plans and I'm sure we're all set. Okay, better get a second. All second. And any further discussion? Yeah, I, 
the south side's not very well lit on the common, is it? I mean, it's seven to nine. It's going to be dark throughout this whole thing. There, there's no way elementary school will just let them drive in the driveway one way and drive out of the driveway the other way. It would seem more safer than the common. I guess it's yeah. John, we had looked at possibly North Hadley Fire Station as well. That's all part of the planning process. I can certainly get with uh, Annie and with the fire chief and, and Jenny and Jake, and we can, you know, discuss that further. Yeah, I'm certainly, uh, I'm open to having a conversation. Just to clarify, I really appreciate what public safety and park and rec are doing, and I want to provide options for families. I also would say that um, we've had a pretty successful, a very successful start, right? So we have not had any uh, positive cases. The mitigation strategies are working. There are a number of people who very much wanted to see schools entirely open. I was concerned about this idea of A, sending mixed messages, and two, having, um, having anything come from an event that is then attributed back to the schools. I mean, I'm so knock on wood right now that we got our staff in 100%. That's a miracle. I just got a text from a superintendent last night. Their staff just agreed to show up for work as of last night. So our staff has been in, our schools have been open. We have had no positive cases, knock on wood right now. And so I'm just extremely, cautious in wanting to make sure that we maintain this and don't step backwards at all. And I am not implying that this event would any way do that. Um, it would be completely just luck, but not luck, or perhaps lack thereof, that something coincidentally could occur. But that's just to make clear what some of my um, reservation is in terms of it being perceived at all as a school event. And I know it's not, it's just about clarity of communication, right? If in any way it's perceived as a school event, that is the craziest mixed messaging I could possibly give to the community. Yeah. And I'm not entirely sure about how, no matter how carefully one communicates, um, that there's the risk of that happening, right? Which um, would feel perhaps outrageous to some families, either because they felt it wasn't safe or because they don't understand why they were waiting six weeks for their kids to go to school, but this other event could happen, um, which is entirely different. So I really wanna be clear that I'm not implying that anything about this is, is unsafe. I'm talking about trying to manage messaging, which maybe I am exercising some sort of overreach here and trying to control things I can't control. All that to say, I am happy to talk with public safety to try to be helpful, and maybe it's just around getting clear messaging. So that that's what I'm trying to think my way through right now. How about I have another option um, since, and I, and I agree. I think it's a hard uh, thing right now, Annie, for you to. Uh, yes, you per, you approve the what they're doing, but. And I understand you don't want it to be a school sanction, so you feel like if it's going to be on school property, people are going to think that it's a school sponsored uh, activity. I, and I get that. What about the senior center library in the uh, Legion parking lot and using those facilities in the center of town uh, just to have people drive through, um, go around the circle and then come out again? Is that a possibility that you might look at, Mike? Um, I think that's a, that might help. That's yeah, well, absolutely. I was going to suggest that because it appears that uh, it will be properly paved in a month uh, yeah. for Halloween. Um, and that's really, it's got really good lighting. You can park on both sides and cars can still drive through. We don't yeah. need to use the Legion lot. It's perfectly safe. One way in, one way out. Yeah, and if they had to egress or if you had to use the Legion parking lot, I'm sure that they wouldn't mind um, if they need to set up something and let the ones that are uh, setting up this activity, if they feel they need to stretch it out and they need more parking. Um, I'm sure that I can, we can contact Mr. Bukowski, who's now the uh, commander there, and I'm sure that he, it wouldn't bother him at all. So let's, let's see how uh, our officers are going to set it up and park and rec and um, I think we could offer that to them. Is every, would everybody be in favor of that? 
can we uh, revise the motion to basically give them blanket approval to use uh, any town facilities on the 30th for this event and just please come back to us at the next meeting with some more details of where and how it'll happen that way you yeah. can proceed yeah so. I think that's I think that's great I think we're just trying to throw out options for them that will be safe for everybody and I, I think the last one that I offered I think would be a good alternative for everybody is it yeah, the just, 30th or the 31st 30th. 30th okay I was 30th. Ask you too. Um, and you know, like I said, we can certainly explore all those options. My my only um, my only issue is is I I don't I wouldn't I appreciate the chair uh, making the blanket uh, approval suggestion just because you know if we end up with forty or fifty people participating, that's forty or fifty vehicles we need to fit into a parking lot with families, and we need to make sure we can keep people far enough apart. That it stays safe which is why you know the common was obviously one of the first choices so it's just one of those things where a lot of it's going to have to do with how many participants and then we'll bring it back and mm -hmm. well, well that's why i offered stuff. that's why i offered the legion too before yeah. asking them because that would give you some additional parking and spacing right I was going to ask too, you know, it seems like maybe a drive through type event might be a little bit more safer and easier to control than something where, and I think this is probably the problem too with the schools is if we get a hundred cars, let's say four people per car parked in the common, it's only a matter of time between before kids are running around playing together and well, they're not kind parking. Of become a tight, you know, social event where people are much closer than six feet and that's what we've been trying to prevent at the school. So it's sending that mixed message. Whereas if it's a drive-through event where it might not be as much fun, but kind of is more town sanctioned and safe. I don't know. That's just something I'm thinking about is the optics of having kind of a big town gathering in the common could be tricky to navigate. Yeah, I, I completely understand that. I can I can assure you that the, the planning of the event will always will will continue to be. It was at the beginning. Will continue to be the a drive through. But you're right in that you know in having a gigantic area in the middle, it could encourage folks to come out. Um, but the event itself will be drive through and it will stay that way. So we'll just try to work the plans up and and go from there. Yeah, I wish you would be more controlled at the library and the senior center. If you just went around the big horseshoe and, and have your cars set up, yeah. Well, take a look at it either way, Mike. And I'm for whatever whatever the rest of the board decides. Great. So it looks like it's going to work, and I, you know, it, it'll be a safe safe deal for the kids. So I, I, yeah. I thank I thank the officers for coming up with that. I think it's perfect. So uh, motion on the table. Yeah, we just we had a motion and a second. We need the motion revised to just give that blanket authorization to do this and bring it back. So I'll make a motion to give them a blanket to yeah, have them bring it back to us whatever they want. <laughs> I'll still second it. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thanks, Park and Rec and Officer Marini. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we'll move on to the tri board meeting. Um, sorry for that little delay, but I wanted to get them out, out of here for the night. Um, so first we have uh, something we need to tackle regarding uh, annual town meeting or special town meeting, I should say. Uh, David sent out an email, I believe it was this afternoon. Uh, we'd like to push back special town meeting to November 14th. Um, the reason for that is we do not have an actual budget from the state yet. So we don't have solid numbers about state contributions, school choice funds, things along those lines. Um, based on the numbers that I was presented today um, by the assessors and by the collector's office, if we don't tighten up our numbers a little better, uh, we either need to find $700,000 or we're looking at a tax increase of 200 ish dollars for the average uh, residents next year. Uh, that's, that's based on our current budget and numbers. 
So uh, the only way around that would be probably you know using some free cash, something along those lines, which you know. But you can try pushing for next year. So there, there's a lot of moving parts, and we really just need more time, and we really just need to hope that the state gets their act together and can give us a real budget before we set the tax rate. So did we, did we not get free cash certified, David? Free cash is uh, they're working on it right now. It's exchanging emails with the accountant. Okay. We're getting we're getting close. So you'll have that next next week. We have a meeting on the seventh, correct? Yes. Yes, we do. Okay, so we might have the numbers next week that we can take a look at. And David. Would you mind giving your estimate of what that free cash looks like at this point? Right now, it looks like it's three hundred thousand okay. dollars. And well, so, a little bit more than was uh, out there. It was two something, wasn't it originally? And we had talked about three thousand, three hundred thousand dollars of free cash this round. So this is right on target. Okay. I don't have a problem pushing it back. Do you need a vote on that or not? I believe we do. Uh, yeah, I'll second it to move the date. Yeah, I'll first it. Any motion, to, motion to move the date to November 14th until we have our, all our numbers in. Any, and John, you second There's that. a couple hundred thousand, uh, there's a couple hundred thousand or so in capital too that I thought we were going to uh, postpone until annual, and they're all still on there. So I don't know if that was accounted in or not. So I think that's gotta, them. Go ahead. Let's take this one step at a time here. Uh, we got a motion in a second to move the meeting back to November 14th. Uh, we're still working on details. Uh, it may have to be inside, socially distant, whether at that time. Uh, we're, we're working on options. So uh, Chief Spanknable has a bunch of plans he's, he's spinning up. So we need a little bit more time, but pushing it back gives us time to do that. So uh, any further discussion? I just, I just wanted to say I did speak to Mike, and uh, he did say it would be a safe thing within the building since the numbers have been increased um, so that they could set it up so that there would be safe s distancing. Any further discussion on that? All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, so then now, um, you know, we can talk about the articles if we want to go through there. I know uh, CPA voted the other night on their recommendations. Uh, Finance Committee, have you all voted on, on your recommendations or do you want to go through and do that now? We've, we reviewed everything last night and voted on, on all the recommendations. Uh, you had uh, uh, left it open a couple of uh, items, one of which was the stretch energy code. Right. We did and we had questions on that. I don't know if we were actually um, just because there was questions whether that was even going to show our recommendation or not, but we had a lot of questions on that one. So we did everything. What, what article did we get up to, David? You, um, you approved everything for articles one through 12. You uh, had questions about article 13, which is the West Street Common uh, CPA uh, article. And uh, Chris Okafor is here. If you have any questions, he can address them. And then the adoption of the stretch energy code, you were concerned about the, uh, the costs of uh, on uh, future building projects if you adopted that. And uh, we agreed that uh, we would uh, defer that until tonight because the people who were proposing it were not available last night. So, uh, I thought we uh, voted down, down the common. You did. Okay. So David, why don't we go through the warrant, uh, the select board can vote them. We should probably skip, I'm looking at two, three, seven, and eight, which would be the items involving finances that may change with the state data that we're looking at. Is that what everybody's saying? Yes, okay, so 
Article one is a prior year, two prior year bills, one for the uh, water department, one for the sewer department. I believe this is for services associated with chemicals. And it was a billing error by the vendor. They sent the invoices to the wrong address at the end of the uh, fiscal year. And by the time that they came around, we had closed the books. So now we need a nine tenths majority vote to pay for this. Okay, so I'll make a uh, motion to, or if I could get a motion to recommend this. I'll make a motion to recommend this. Second. All right, and then all those, in any further discussion on this? And all those in favor? Aye. 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 I'm sorry, who's, who seconded that? I missed it, I'm sorry. Christian. I did. Thank you, sorry about that. Yep. And then all right. Skipping over Article 2, Article 3 is the fund balance uh, transfers, and this is the housekeeping article where we sweep up uh, old unused um, uh, balances left over from projects that have uh, uh, been successfully concluded, and we also adjust any borrowing authorization. So, uh, I had a long list of projects that uh, I've been advised that these projects are active. So we only have three cash articles and two borrowing articles. The first is the classification compensation plan. We have $4,000 left in that. We're not using it, so it can be returned to capital stabilization. We have uh, a prior year bill to the ZBA for 568 dollars and seven cents they haven't used it so that can be swept up to capital stabilization and then we have a preservation article for north hadley village hall for ten thousand from cpa so that can be returned to the cpa we have two borrowings that we have to cancel the first one is the basement room in town hall that was uh, uh, requested by the municipal building committee for $17,500 and they decided that they were not gonna move forward with that project. So we need to revise that borrowing authorization down to zero. And then the capital assets schedule for $6,550, the Department of Revenue has ruled that that's an ineligible uh, borrowing project. So we need to reduce that down to zero as well. There's no impact upon the taxes. This is strictly housekeeping. So moved. Second. Okay. All right, got Christian with a second. Any further discussion? All, right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 The next one is the creation of new revolving fund for the electronic permits in the building department. Uh, we signed that contract after town meeting. Uh, the uh, vendor for the electronic um, permits gets paid $10 per permit. We don't have a mechanism for efficiently making that payment. Uh, so setting up this revolving fund will take pressure off the operating budget and make sure that we have a smooth uh, mechanism for uh, paying the vendor. So moved. Second. In a second by Christian. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Next one is uh, account transfers, and this is to clean up a couple of uh, issues uh, that were um, left over and identified in the uh, in the uh, 2019 audit. Uh, the first one is the um, um, school gift account for $32,100 that was uh, by mistake of transferred over to the general fund and it resulted in us getting additional free cash in the amount of $32,100. Uh, but it took money away from the schools and so that grant uh, needs to be replenished and since we got extra money and free cash I'm proposing that we replenish the school and make them whole with free cash. Uh, the other one was the leftover um, project at Zaturka Park. We uh, spent uh, $1,400.10 uh, 
above and beyond the CPA uh, amount allotted for that project and it was for grass mowing, which is not an eligible CPA uh, cost. So we would use uh, $1,410 of free cash to replenish CPA. No impact on taxes. Who got charged, for, who mowed the lawn for $1,400.10? I think this was at the end of the project when we had run out of money and there's weeds growing all over. Yeah. The, the neighbors were complaining. So we just said, go ahead and mow it and we'll clean it up afterwards. So here we are cleaning it up afterwards. Oh, it, was, okay. it was brush hogging the hill, uh, all of Zedrucker Park. It was waist high grass by the time we got to it. And so they did a couple cleanups there and that was the 1400. Who, who did the cleanups, David? Uh, was it Omasco that did the mowing? I'm not sure. No, I think it was a vendor. Um, uh, Chris, can you remember the name of the company that did the mowing there? You're mute. You're, you're on mute. Read my lips. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's our current vendor that uh, takes care of uh, the cemetery from um, Berta Town. Okay. Yeah. I'll make a motion to accept the account transfers. Second, second. All right. Second. Any further discussion? discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. The next one is um, modification of exempt, uh, exemption of taxes. And I think I saw Dan Zadonik on. Uh, this is submitted by the assessors and they may want to speak to this. There is currently an exemption allowed uh, for income qualifying seniors to defer taxes uh, for um, until the property that they're living in is sold uh, for whatever reason. Um, the town to assess an 8% interest on those unpaid deferred taxes and the are thinking that given the economic climate we are in we may want to choose to drop that uh, interest uh, from eight percent to four percent um, and the finance committee debated this last night and uh, came up with a recommendation to support this Dan are you on board uh, yep I'm here okay did I miss any uh, detail there uh no not really there's only one uh, account that this would affect yeah there's one person in town that defers all of their taxes we're not looking at this as being something that a lot of people are going to take advantage of i've been doing this 35 years and there's only one person in that entire time that has deferred the taxes but the board is the assessors are looking at it thinking a few more people might take advantage if the interest rate was dropped to 4% and they don't have to defer all of their taxes. They could defer some. So if they're having problems right now making tax payments, uh, they could defer $500 or a thousand dollars a year at 4%, which is a lot cheaper than if it goes into tax title and they're paying 16% on it. And this way we feel that seniors wouldn't have to, decide if they want to pay for medication, food, or heat versus paying their taxes off. And this, if an average house in town were to take advantage of this and defer their full taxes, it would amount to about $170 interest reduction a year. So it's not really a lot of money, but it, it's something that might help a senior stay in their home. And the town eventually gets the money plus the interest. Yeah, when the, there's a lien filed at the registry and when the person chooses either to pay it off or the house, they pass away and the house gets sold, the town will collect all that money plus the interest on it. And for the person that's in it now, it's been 8%. It will stay at 8% for this fiscal year and all the prior fiscal years. But if they choose to opt into it next year, it'll, the interest rate will drop for, to 4% for that one year and any years going forward. And do you think having it be 
fixed like that is good as opposed to tying it to like the prime interest rate or something like that? I'm just uh, thinking of other ways to finance something like that. Right now, if we choose, if we don't do anything, it's at 8%. We would have to make an adjustment each year, which I'm sure my board is quite open to if interest rates were to go up. It wouldn't make sense if, if we're paying 6% to borrow money to be charging somebody 4%. We would just have to go in in a future year and put this article back on, increasing it from four to five or four to six or back up to eight. Yeah. I think one of the things that this article does is that it shows that the town's paying attention to seniors who are on somewhat limited income. There is a lim income limit on this, isn't there, Dan? Yes. Uh, it, this is only open to people that are 65 and older that have $20,000 or less in gross receipts a year. And I have to apologize to finance. Last night I said there, I thought there was an a asset limit, but there is not. But I don't see anybody that's got a sizable amount of money in the bank that they're earning 1% on is going to keep the money in the bank so that, keep, that they can pay 4% by deferring their taxes. Can I get a motion? I move that we accept. Second. Okay. Second by Joyce. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Article seven, we're skipping over. Article eight, we're going to skip over. Uh, articles nine through 13 are CPA articles. Sometimes the select board uh, makes a recommendation, sometimes they don't. I don't know if you would like to do I think we should, because uh, people always ask us our feelings when we're up there anyways, and they want to know who voted for and who voted against these things in the recommendation phase. So, I mean, it's one more piece of data for people to look at. So the first one is for $100,000 for COVID-related uh, uh, emergency rental assistance um, and this was uh, approved by the CPA and uh, the finance committee uh, and I think uh, Molly is available to speak to this issue um, and, a question, and a question came up about um, uh, landlords uh, receiving money with they if they also uh, um, oh, the town back taxes or ch municipal charges. Mm -hmm. um, and just uh, Dylan's on the call as well. Uh, he's co-chair of the committee and he's been doing a lot of the legwork too. Um, yeah, I think um, the issue with the landlords, the funds are clearly intended to provide relief to the tenant, right? So the whole point is to make sure that people don't lose their housing. That's the, the priority of it. Um, and then it certainly makes sense in that regard to keep the tenant in their home that you want the payment to go directly to the landlord. So, you know, and then if you take it a step further, as, as was pointed out at finance last night, do you want to take money out of one town bucket, the CPA taxpayer dollar bucket, um, and have somebody owing money to the town? So, I mean, it, it certainly makes sense that we you know, wouldn't want the landlord to be walking away with money when there's a liability to the town. So I think we just need to look into the legality, legality of it um, to be sure that that can be done. But I, I do know I saw a thread at some point where this came up in another town as well, that they wanted to make sure that they weren't, you know, again, robbing one bucket at the expense of another. So as, lo as long as it can be done, I think, you know, we're more than happy to make sure that that's a provision. How much would one person be eligible for, Molly? Um, so there's a range. So what we're looking at is coming up with a price for like one, one bedroom unit, two bedroom unit, three bedroom unit, and then it would be capped at three months. So, um, and I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but I think, um, and Dylan, correct me if I'm wrong, so it's like $500 for a one bedroom. Yep, yeah, 500 right? for a one bedroom, 750 for a two bedroom, 1,000 for a three or larger. Mm -hmm. So are, are we talking about houses? Because we really don't have condos or anything like that. Um, 
who would be who would be eligible for this? So people with a certain amount of income. Right. There would be an income requirement. Um, so it, it would be uh, targeted to uh, median median income in the town, which is how um, uh, other municipalities are handling it. And uh, it looks like there are about 83 municipalities in the Commonwealth that are um, have this program in place. And there are many more like us who are trying to come online. So um, I was actually really surprised because the question came up at the CPA meeting about how many rental units we had in town. So uh, like most questions, I called Dan Zidonic, right, who seems to have the, the best data points in town for these types of things. And I was surprised when Dan called me back and said that um, he couldn't, we don't actually track like um, housing rentals. We don't really know formally in the database what that stock looks like. But there are actually, I think, 244 um, multifamily and, and other rental units in town. And then when I thought about it, you think about Middle Street and all of the, you know, larger homes where there may be a um, two family or three apartments in a house and that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. then, of course, you have the um, larger complexes with eight or more units. We have a, a small number of those. And is this eligible for just Hadley residents? Yes, you have to be a Hadley resident. Okay, registered voter. Is that how you determine that? Uh, no, it would be based on proof of residency. Okay. I mean, you have people that come in for six months or 12 months out of the year. Um, so that's how I was wondering, how would you decipher if they were just kind of like a transient rental person or they actually, you know, rental for a long period of time would they how would that qualify so there would be some logistics on on who would who would get it to tell you the truth yeah and and the way that you know the program would work again we'd be working with a third party agency to do all of the income uh, mm -hmm. and residency uh, verification work but you know ideally um, the whole point of it is somebody who can prove that they've been harmed um, due to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So they would have to have been resident, you know, fairly recently during the pandemic and they would have to be able to prove that they lost their job. You know, I mean, if, if somebody yeah. moved here last November or something like that um, in good faith and they got a job at one of the restaurants and they lost their job and they can't pay their rent, I mean, they would still be eligible. Mm -hmm. but, okay. Yeah, but somebody couldn't just like move to town next week to take advantage of the program. Correct. Okay. And I assume it's just residential rentals only, no commercial or industrial, right? Since we're talking bedrooms. So, yeah. Strict, strictly people. Yeah. Okay. Can we get Can a make a motion to approve this uh, article? I'll move. All right, second, second. Jane. And any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, articles 10, 11, and 12 have to do with cemeteries when funding it through CPA. Can we handle that as a bundle? Sure. All Sounds right, and Alan Weinberg um, on, on the line. Yes. I'm here. You want to uh, quickly roll up, walk us through these um, these uh, projects? I think this is the culmination of a multi-year effort on your part to rehab the uh, town-owned cemeteries. Right. We're uh, There's five cemeteries. We've been doing them for the last few years. Uh, this will be the last uh, round. Uh, this year we're doing Old Hadley and uh, Plainville. We originally did Hakanam uh, two years ago. So what we're asking for is to uh, restore the gravestones, the worst of them, the ones that are broken, falling down, leaning strongly in uh, North Hadley and in Russellville. Um, the Russellville's got about 42 stones that need to be fixed. And North Hadley's got about 94 that need to be fixed. And the amounts are, uh, for North Hadley, we're asking for $60,000 to do that work. And in Russellville, we're asking for $30,000 to do that work. 
we in the past these projects have come in under under budget so we usually give money back to CPA hopefully we'll be able to do that again this year the third project is um, at Hakanam and it's uh, it's not gravestone restoration it's replacing the stone wall uh, that's been there it's been in bad disrepair falling down uh, we've been kicking this around for 10 years or so uh, about what to do with it and we hired somebody uh, a landscape architect with CPA money that we received last year to do a study uh, and come up with some alternatives and what was decided on was the best thing the most cost-effective and the most uh, functional would be not to try to repair the stone wall which would be quite expensive and probably impossible but to replace it uh, retire it and replace it with a, uh, a fence of granite posts with a steel chain which is quite attractive. It's, you can see it's at other cemeteries in the area and it'll be easier to, to install. Uh, it still costs a, a, good, a good amount, but it'll be less than trying to rebuild that stone wall. And there'll be some other advantages uh, functionally as well. So uh, that's, that's the third project that we hope to uh, proceed with. We have uh, received, for all these projects, we received historical commission blessings and for the Hakanam, the Hakanam Village Association gave us a letter of support. We talked to multiple uh, people in Hakanam, probably about 20 or 25, and everybody's okay with it and likes it. That's it. Motion to accept the uh, cemetery repairs on all the articles. Second. Seconded by Christian. Any further discussion? I just think it's important to keep our cemeteries up, and I think this is a good way to do it. We might get there someday. <laughs> okay. Alan, you're doing a great job. Thank you. It's been, an honor. it's been an honor. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Article 13 is CPA uh, uh, for the West Street Common. Uh, it was approved by CPA. The Finance Committee voted against it. Um, Chris Okafor, I think you're available to describe this project. Uh, yes. Mr. Chairman, uh, this is the hardly common. If you recall, I came before the board about a year ago requesting, and then uh, the board authorized me to take a look and, and see how we can do some studies. Uh, the hardly common, Mr. Chairman, is... Um, one of the, if not the major jewel in town. But um, if you look at the way the common looks right now, due to Route 9 and the commercial traffic with all the, uh, we, we believe that uh, the common needs some um, makeup or um, upgrade. And also, we also believe that the town is uh, not utilizing the common to the best advantage. So we, we decided to come up with a study. We went before the CPA to get some money, about 30000 I submitted a, a proposal from one of the landscape architects who also have uh, designed a couple of um, major parks in the area. And um, the CPA approved it five to two. But I'm told that the finance committee uh, voted everything down yesterday. Uh, my, my thought process or my idea, Mr. Chairman, is uh, I would think, I think the town should take, I, I think the town should allow us to do, this, bring, do the study because in the course of doing the study, we will come before. We lost him. The selection board and the public will have opportunity to voice their opinion on how towards the dike. Uh, just the little improvement that DPW performed over there. Uh, that place has been very attractive to people. Please. What, what do you actually want to do for $30,000? Individuals come in, enjoy the. Chris, if you turn off your video, your uh, audio will probably work better.
Anybody there? Hello? I think we uh, lost him. The Finance Committee, uh, how your vote went last night. So on our vote, uh, the problem, the, the reason why we voted this down was basically because we felt that there, we didn't really know what the study was for. We wanted the more of public comment first and we wanted to know what is it that we're exactly studying. Uh, so it was a little uncomfortable for us to be spending $30,000 of taxpayer money when we weren't sure of what was being studied. Um, there, you know, there's all kinds of things going out there, such as parking meters, you know, things like that. And if we know right away, we don't want that, then we don't want our taxpayer money to be spent on something like that. We want to, we want to know what we're studying first. We don't want tax, tax, we don't want uh, meters on the town common. Right. We're one of the oldest town commons still survived in Massachusetts. No. Seemed like a very, very high price too. Yeah, I, I'd like to know what they actually would like to do to the town common before I take a vote on this. If they want to bring this back for another meeting and give me a little more detailed report on what exactly is that they expect of the town common, then I'm willing to listen to it. So we need a we need a motion uh, to give town meeting floor. Does, does Chris have a, any more comments he wants to make about what the study showed? No, we, we haven't done the study yet. We just let the money to do the study. And also part, part of that study, we, uh, we include the design phase. We include the comment before the select board and the public. We have uh, opportunity to, site, to do site analysis and also input on how we can uh, improve what can we do to improve that open space so the thirty thousand dollars is for a study of what could be done to the common to improve it yes thank you okay that's a little bit different than uh, uh, parking meters for sure chris chris as part of this as part of the study will there be any kind of um public forum or something along those lines where people can like, give input on the common? Uh, yes, there will, there will be public forum. There will be uh, kickoff uh, meetings with the, with the select board, uh, public forum where individuals can come in or groups can come in and, uh, before the select board and also put in their own comments. And uh, the, the landscape architect will collect all these facts, including um, the any any local regulations that or concerning the common if there are deeds or restrictions and all the entities that uh, are required to make uh, comments like the conservation or the historical commission and then and do and do some presentation and and so and at the end we come to a consensus on various uh, activities that we think will be useful at, uh, at the common. And then the select board and the town meeting we approve if we have to go forward. Uh, the, the, our goal is that um, the common should be able to, every individual or group should be able to use the common, including, um, um, uh, you know, it'd be, it'd be, right now, if you look at the common, the sidewalks already, they failed. We can't use the sidewalks. Uh, we, if you, if you look at the common, uh, we should be able to do biking, we should be able to do concert, we should be able to uh, do as many things that would bring the, the town people together to a common place. Uh, it's a very nice location, but it's not well utilized. And so we are looking for ways we can uh, come up with various entities, groups, interest groups, and select board on how we can Put a common goal to, yeah, and that is that is where that is where we are. But um, I don't think thirty thousand is a big money for such a project, Mr. Chairman. I the what the town will benefit on the long run when the final conclusion comes to it is huge. Uh, if you look at uh, Route Nine, Route Nine is very busy. Uh, 
root 9 goes through the middle of the common. There is no way to, uh, if there are events at uh, the, south, uh, the south part of the common, or even at the north end, to cross is a nightmare. This, uh, this, uh, this program will be part of the study. Uh, will be how can we link them together. Uh, if you look at uh, historical preservation, uh, if you look at the today, the current uh, light poles we have on the common, uh, does not beautify the common. So this study we enhance that. The common will serve as a complete city program, whereby we will have bikers, restaurants, people, both uh, the right sidewalks will be fixed. The field will be designed in various ways based on input from the public and also it's not going to be a one-year phase. Our thinking is that uh, if we go through this study and we are successful, it might lead us to a, a three to five year phase of uh, improving the common. And, uh, but these are the arguments I made before the CPA. Um, uh, the finance committee, I, was, I wish I had the opportunity to come before them to make the argument, but uh, they voted it down. I don't actually know the reason why. Uh, because 30,000 for uh, my view is not, um, uh, it's not a, yes, for this kind of project, Mr. Chairman, it's not something that uh, I thought would be voted down. Yes. I'd like, I'd like to make a motion right now, and Chris, it has nothing against you, but at this time when we're trying to um, save our tax dollars, um, and CPA is tax dollars. I'm going to kind of defer this at this moment. I'm going to vote no. I'd like to make a motion to vote no on this. Um, a town common uh, in over years wasn't used for town purposes except for people wanting to go out there, play frisbee, play a little catch, um, do those kinds of things. It wasn't always necessary to do events on the town common. It became more common over the last few years that people wanted to use it for the Hadley Asparagus Festival or the Kessel um, Trust uh, run or something of that nature. Um, this has only been of late that people have wanted to use our town common because it's convenient uh, for theirs. And now they're not actually town people. Uh, the people that live on the town common move there for that reason, for the tranquility of a peaceful area. So I'm kind of just going to back off on this right now, and I would like to make a motion that we vote no on this uh, and maybe bring it up at the uh, Springtown meeting or bring it up again at that point when we know what our finances are. Yeah, I, I'm going to second it because we're over $700,000 in deficit. And this is not, we've, we're closing roads because we can't replace pipes under them. And we're worried about beautifying the common. It's sufficient enough for all the organizations that are using it right now, and they're happy with it. And all the citizens on the common are happy. So we have a motion by Joyce and a second by John. And just to be clear, if we vote yes to this motion, we're voting to not recommend this article, correct? So I have that straight. Correct. Okay. All right. So. Any further discussion? Yes, I would like to speak in favor of it because I think that spending CPA money is not like adding to the current tax rate right now and doing a study will take several years and hopefully we'll be out of our crises of COVID by then in terms of financing. And I think that the common is one of the, really as Chris said, one of the jewels of Hadley and it should look good. The sidewalks I used to live there are terrible and they have been for years. And there's a lot of things that could be done to make it much more appealing. And I think we should start the process instead of kicking the can down the road and let a study be done. But sidewalks don't come out of CPA money, Jane. The study, sidewalks... comes, the study comes out of CPA money. Right, but not it's not the overall picture. I agree. It's the overall picture we're looking for. Yeah, exactly. And that, and we should have more input instead of voting on this tonight. I'd like more input from the people that live on the common. 
because they have not been happy with some of the activities that have occurred on the common because they haven't been well informed. So that's why I voted the way I did for tonight until we have more input. Okay, any further discussion? Yeah, I just have one thing I wanted to just mention as a member of the CPA committee, I just wanted you to know where we, where we were at with that um, because we really, we had a lot of discussion on this one. We were really uncomfortable with this altogether. So if you really look at the article, we put all these conditions in there that uh, with the kickoff meeting um, and who had to be part of the kickoff meeting, we listed conditions as far as within, you know, as public input um, two times at 10%. This is all conditions at the CPA. CPA was not comfortable with this at all. Um, but we did not want to not let this be part of discussion. So for one, my vote on CPA was to let this go through. So my vote was yes on CPA because this way it brings it to discussion. If CPA votes it down, it's, it doesn't even get on the warrant. So we brought this forward so that we can start to have discussions, but my vote for, um, because I just don't feel that, that we're ready for it at this time, my vote for um, finance was no, because I felt like it wasn't, I think that we don't need to spend the money at this point, we could first get the input and then spend the money. So that's where we were at with CPA, that's why it's in front of you now, it was just so that it could be discussed. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, to get the input is part of the study. Is the expert who will who will uh, lead this input, and then we will, they will the so we're not the, it's not me or Public Works. We are getting hiring experts, and then they will organize the input and the public hearing before the select board, the kickoff, and uh, and uh, in that kickoff, just like the CPA said, those are the things that we're looking for. I um, and then. They will gather all the facts and all the discussions that came out of those these various hearings and put together a a picture of how and recommendations and then it's those pictures and recommendations that the select board or or the finance committee will now say, okay, how can we have the cost of those recommendations based on people's input, even the neighbors uh, around around the, the common, they will have opportunity to speak. Well, when we don't have the experts to come in to begin this process, it's not the public works that will organize them to come and before the select board. The public works is coming before the select board and before the CPA and other authorities to get approval to bring the experts so that we can, they, they can begin this, this process of collecting data. And then, but if it's voted down, we won't have the opportunity to have a, a platform for residents or groups to come together to put uh, whatever, even if it means not going forward, or at least have a sense of how can we improve this open space? You know, is it, it's a nice open space, it's a jewel, but we cannot but every so often ask ourselves, how can we improve this place? We got to... Thank you, Chris. Uh, we just got to keep moving here. So um, any further discussion from the select board or finance? Do you mind if we just change the motion so that it's not an inverse of the thing, just so we can be clear? So it's yep. not... Joyce, would you would you mind revising that or accepting a re uh, amendment to that motion from Christian? What would you like? What, what would just, you like it to say? Just a motion to approve so that a yes is a yes and a no is a no, just so it's clear. That, that would make my life easier. Yeah. Well, does yes mean no or does no mean yes? <laughs> that's that's where I'm confused. That's why I'm just asking for a straight motion. <laughs> yeah, straight, straight motion. Uh, yes vote will uh, table this until further notice. Sounds good. No, 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 no. no. I'm, what I'm saying is a motion, just a yes is you agree to it. And a no is you disagree with it. Yeah, That's just like every other warrant article, the motion is to recommend this to town meeting. Recommend, a yes vote would recommend it. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Are, are, Joyce, do you accept that amendment there? Yes. Okay. Do we need to re-second, Jennifer? I can second if. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any further discussion on that? All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. No. no. 
No, mine's a no. Wait, I'm confused. <laughs> it's a no. <laughs> I'm gonna ask for a roll call. I'm gonna ask for a roll call on this, please. Bill? No. Nevin Smith? Yes. Tungalo? No. Skevitz? No, in the best interest of the town. And Stanley? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that was a long one. Moving on, David. God, you okay. confused me. I'm getting old. All right. Thank you. Um, special legislation about uh, convert the uh, elected Board of Health to an appointed Board of Health. Finance Committee did not make a recommendation on this. Okay, any discussion or motion, please? I, I, I have a hard time with this one because I do, I do agree with the sentiment of the motion uh, or the article, but I have a hard time just at this point in time saying yes to it because I feel like um, it's coming at an odd time just with the Board of Health is very vis uh, present right now, where in the past I feel like it hasn't been nearly as present as it has been since COVID started. And I really think, you know, we could use a staff person at the Board of Health uh, to do a lot of the day-to-day -day activities based on the budget. We're not hiring anybody to fill that position anytime soon. And I just really feel like the people that are on the board now were elected and having to go through that election process makes them committed to the position. Whereas if it's appointed, I feel like once people see what the work is like, they, they won't want to do it anymore. And so that the fact that people had to run for election um, and commit to this board for, I think they have a five, five year term or three year term. I'm not sure what it's it is, three. but three three-year term, uh, that's, a, that's a big commitment and uh, something that I think makes people committed to it right now. As much as I do agree with having more board positions be appointed in town than elected, but um, so it makes it a challenge. So I, I, think, I it, think it's, go Joyce. Um, I, I think it's important that we move to the appointment level. Um, these people may not be there uh, for a long term, and I appreciate what they're doing now with what they're doing. I think they're qualified. Um, it's a hard road right now to um, cover this COVID business that we're having. Nobody ever thought that we would, uh, in a position of being on the Board of Health, we would be, we would be facing a COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, this was never in the cards anywhere. Uh, in anywhere in the in, in the whole world, um, but I think in moving forward, we want to make sure that the people that run for these boards are qualified. And um, I certainly do feel that at least two of the people on the board are very well qualified. Um, not necessarily is it can be a learn by error type of thing. Uh, but that's not what you want when you appoint people to the Board of Health. It's an important position. And like a lot of people, I didn't sign up for this, they'll say. I didn't know this was going to happen. Well, no, no, none of us knew that this was going to happen. So I, I think in the long run, in changing this, it doesn't mean that the people on the board wouldn't again be appointed to that position. Uh, just as we did with the town clerk and the treasurer. I mean, we did not say that they were not going to be appointed when we decided to change that over. They are the qualified person that belongs in that job. And I think, you know, that's what we want to look at, but it's long-term. This is not a short-term decision that we're making. So uh, I, I'm in favor of this. So, okay, I'm opposed to it because I agree with what Joyce said. We need to make sure the right people are in the job. But as select board, we need to look at all the uh, boards that run for town and do them all at once and not single out one over the other. Because especially now with um, the way some people are seeing the Board of Health, it looks almost like we might be attacking them, which I know that was not the intent, but we should, we're busy enough with other problems. We should just table this and try and get all of the elected boards 
figure it out, do it at once. So I just wanted to clear up a few things. Um, I asked that this put, be put on the warrant. Um, I want to make it clear that this was not directed at any person that's on the Board of Health now. I can tell you that uh, dealing with COVID, um, I saw problems with our current system, with accountability, and with oversight. The town doesn't have any because they're elected officials. If somebody, and I'm not saying this happened, but if somebody was not qualified and decided to not show up for six months during this pandemic, us as a select board, as a town, we have no ability to say anything to them other than to recall them through a recall election, which could take months and months to do. In an appointed position, at least you can hold people accountable for either doing or not doing their important tasks. Um, another important thing to remember is this does not take effect immediately. So the people that ran for Board of Health would be allowed to finish their terms, just like with the treasurer and the collector's office. So this is really something three years down the line. So the idea that we should wait and take all the, you know, take on all the boards at once, I think is uh, a little bit short-sighted. Uh, just like the treasurer and collector, this is an incremental step in the right direction to make sure that we have qualified people there. Um, so that's why I put it on there. But again, this is about a long-term solution. This is really three years down the line since uh, I think just about everybody on there by the time this legislation goes through the state legislature will have two or three years left of their term. I'll make a motion to accept. Oh, what am I, what am I accepting here? The uh, uh, board recommendation for the Board of Health to be an uh, appointed board legislation. Yeah, I'll second it. Let the taxpayers decide if they want an elected board or if they want a appointed board. Correct. They can do that at town meeting. That's the joy of town meeting. Yep. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 No. I'm waffling, so I'm going back and forth. Um, I'm going to say aye on it. So, 4 1. Uh, the next two articles are planning board articles, so that you typically don't comment on them. And the third one is 17 is the stretch energy code, which the finance committee did not take a vote on last night. They are here in posted meeting. Um, and I guess the questions from last night had to do with the uh, expenses associated with adopting the stretch energy code versus the benefits of adopting the stretch energy code. Yeah, I just wanted to say too that Mark Rabinsky is here from, uh, oh man, Mark, I'm going to forget your title. I'm sorry, but he's helping us with the the, the, the stretch energy code and Jack Sykowski is here from the climate change committee. And so I did, I asked the building inspector, he must be off somewhere else or, um, you know, yeah. what not this evening. That's fine. I think we can explain it. He's got a really good explanation to answer questions as well. But if you guys want to ask your questions, um, you know, you have people here that can help answer them. So, yeah, I'm also joined with Will, uh, Draghi Oates, too, who was on the call. Um, Hello, he's from I ICF oh. International. He's one of our consultants. I'm Mark Rabinsky. I'm the Green Communities Coordinator with the Department of Energy Resources. Yep. Christian, I can jump in and do a quick introduction, then we can field questions, especially from the Finance Committee. I can, yeah, if David's fine with that, or ask David. <laughs> David? Yeah. That's fine. Just, yeah, keep it short just so we can get the questions because we got a lot. We will. Um, and Jennifer, is it possible? Um, can I get sharing privileges? You should be able to get me out now. Uh, let me see if I can share. Hang on. Let me try. Yep. Okay, okay. Try this. Okay. All right, so let's start again, keeping this brief. 
uh, with the end goal. We're hoping that Hadley joins 271 other communities in being designated green through Mass Departments of Energy Resources. Uh, and there are five criteria that we need to meet in order to join these other communities in the state. One of the uh, criteria has to do with the stretch code. And if you take a look here, and Mark will take it a little bit further in just a few minutes, if you take a look, all the colors, um, uh, all the communities that are in sort of the butternut squash color, they are considered, um, they've already adopted the stretch code. So 284 or 81% of Massachusetts communities, including all of our neighbors in every direction, have already adopted the stretch code. Um, the benefits long term for Hadley is a $130,000 designation fee back to the town from this program, uh, as well as all the benefits to the air, the water, our, our planet, our, our town. Um, and we would also have opportunities to apply for grants to reduce energy costs and improve inefficiencies. So, you know, as a citizen of Hadley and sitting in on this meeting and knowing oh, um, the looming deficit, um, this could really be a good time for us to be looking to get back $130,000 that we can use for other um, energy projects in town. Um, here, Mark, can I pass it over to you if you want to take it on the stretch code? I'll stop sure, sharing. Sure. sure, I think I'd like to hear the um, the uh, the the questions from the the finance committee, just in the the interest of time, um, so we can specifically address them. And I'd also like to throw out um, there if if um, since I heard that the special town meeting was is going to be delayed a month, if it would make sense for us to have a separate meeting with the the finance committee to um, address some of their their uh, their questions. Well, I have a question right off the bat. And that is, um, so it, presumably, if we are to gain this $130,000, so, uh, yeah. there would be something, some liberties that we would be giving up, yes? And I'd like to know what those are. Um, so the, in, in becoming a, a green community, there are, are five criteria that you have to meet. Um, the first one, the first two have to deal with zoning and, and permitting. Um, the town likely already meets those, um, given their, their zoning, um, and they already have expedited permitting. So I'm, I'm fairly confident that they already meet those. I'm still waiting for um, a letter from the town, and, and we're working on that separately. The third criteria is, um, is creating a... a is, is doing sort of a, a look at how much energy the town's buildings, their, um, how much energy the town is using, just the municipal buildings. So, you know, town hall, um, senior center, library, street lights, wastewater treatment plant, uh, and the town's vehicles and creating a baseline so that we know how much they're, they're using right now. And then um, creating a plan to reduce that by 20% within five years. I will point out, that it's just a plan to reduce it by 20% by in five years. We're not gonna take those funds back from you if you don't uh, uh, meet that goal. We want you to meet the goal and we'll work with you, but it's not a hard and fast goal. The fourth one is adopting a, a vehicle policy, a fuel efficient vehicle policy. Um, and uh, it, 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 it's meeting any vehicles that the municipality is purchasing has to meet certain miles per gallon um, goals for them. Um, and I can give you more details on that. A lot of the vehicles, if it's over 8,500 um, uh, pounds, gross vehicle weight, they're exempt from it. Things like school buses, fire, uh, right now police vehicles are exempt from that, that policy. And I can go into that a little bit more detail too. The final um, uh, criteria for being a green, a green community is, a, is in the legislation, it's, it's written as reducing the um, life cycle costs of buildings. And the way, so when the legislation was written, we had to interpret that. And the way that a town can meet that is by adopting the stretch energy code. So, um, 
if a town adopts town or city adopts a stretch energy code, they um, uh, um, they can meet criteria five. So if I can chime in real quick, one of the questions I've been getting from people in town is, does this cost more for building a house? And I can tell you that I just did this two years ago and uh, voluntarily followed the stretch energy code. And yes, you could say it costs a little bit more, but really most of what's required is best practices at this point anyways, and most builders are already incorporating it. And what we found is the incentives that are available for meeting the stretch energy code far outweighed any of the extra costs we had in the actual construction requirements. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Mark, but the building inspector had said that this is going to be adopted statewide regardless at any point. So we might as well, at some point. So really we're just kind of getting a jump on it in order to get the, the $130,000 incentive. May I jump in? I think one of the other questions or things that was brought up that this affected could, could trigger things for someone who's doing like a renovation. If somebody was say adding on to their house because they have a senior who's going to move back in or something like that, and all of a sudden to meet this code, they have to do major renovation as opposed to say the new section meets, you know, meets new, would have to meet a new code standard anyway, but is that going to trigger things that will make any type of addition for a household, you know, prohibitive? So addition Paul, if you take a look at the slide that I'm sharing, uh, let's see, current stretch code only applies to new residential construction, new commercial property. Mark, what's the latest on renovations? So additions, renovations, repairs to residential buildings are exempt from the stretch code. Okay. That, it was, that was one of the questions that came up. Yeah, it's what a about, good question. What, it, what about commercial properties? If somebody needs to expand? Uh, all the commercial other. properties, it's um, all new commercial buildings over 100,000 square feet and new commercial buildings over 40,000 square feet um, if they're high energy users like supermarkets or laboratories, those kind of conditions. Okay. Refrigerated warehouses would, would fall into that. Okay. And Paul, here it is in writing. Um, so you can see those designations of um, square footage. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, we just didn't know enough about it last night. So yeah, and, we're, and we're that's supposed the, to be here. And you're with the State Department of Energy? The Massachusetts Department of Energy okay. Resources. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Will, anything you wanted to add about that? Will's really the expert on stretch code. Um, I mean, no, for the most part, I think you all have it covered. I do, I did want people to make sure they do understand that, that those additions and renovations, that's definitely not part of this. And I know that's kind of, you know, usually the bigger concern. Yep. Um, in terms of other costs too, I mean, as you can see, all your neighboring towns, um, are already in there. So the builders, they're likely, you know, they're building outside of Hadley, they're building, you know, in these neighboring towns, they're already working with Raiders. Um, it's kind of baked into the costs. A lot of the measures are, are kind of the same. So again, costs are very, very, very minor. They're a fraction of a, of a total construction budget. And um, you do have Berkshire gas and, and Eversource uh, incentives available to, to offset those. Okay. But I mean, yeah, I think I know that, you know, most of you covered it and that's kind of really all I've had to add unless others have questions. I will also point out too that this is already part of the energy code. As, as David had mentioned, um, you can take a, a performance path or a prescriptive path. And the prescriptive path is saying, you know, you have to have a certain R value in the walls. You have to have um, certain windows. Your, your, your furnace has to meet this. Um, the performance path is saying is just looking at the building overall and and it having to meet a certain performance goal. So it's, it's really a much nicer way to build, I think, because you're basing it on the, the actual performance of the building and you're testing that performance of the building as opposed to just checking off a list and it's being um, verified afterwards by uh, uh, energy rater. Um, so a lot of folks like, like um, uh, uh, David have already chosen to do the, the performance path too. So it's, it's pretty common. And when you adopt the stretch code, you're just getting rid of the prescriptive path and saying we're only going performance path. And as Will mentioned too, there are incentives right now for, um, uh, for um, offsetting the, the, a lot of the upgrades that you might have to make and the, um, the uh, home energy rater. And I can go into, we've done models on this. I can get in, 
a little bit deeper into this as well. Um, Mark, a question for you. Uh, it's my understanding we're too late in the year to apply for this year, but we could look forward to applying for next year, or where do things stand? You can apply right up until the end of the year for green communities, and, and um, I, I think that'd be great if you could. There's, there's still a lot of work to do, particularly on criteria three with the yeah. um, energy, energy resource or energy, um, uh, looking at your energy baseline and your, and your plan. Um, but I, I'm ready and willing to, to work forward with you on that. Yeah, so for the members of the select board and the members of the finance committee, are there other questions that we haven't addressed? Um, and I know you've seen that a diagram and we're kind of on an island here. We're one of the last to move forward with this, but um, certainly there's opportunities for our town. One other thing about stretch code is that if you don't like it, you can always vote it down. If, if you vote it, you vote for it at, at town meeting, you can take a vote again at town meeting and, and um, say, we don't want it anymore. You won't be a green community anymore, um, but uh, uh, you, know, you, you, can, you can vote it down. Um, we've never had a community vote it down, just to give you some, some history on that. They've all stuck with it. Um, uh, yeah. I, I do have one more question, and it's on the, um, you said part of it has to do with vehicles um, being um, a certain energy. Um, I, we, we have in the past, especially the fire department, has um, purchased like uh, UMass surplus vehicles. They've purchased used vehicles. I mean, is that going to stop us from the future of buying these older vehicles because they don't meet the um, energy efficiency? So that's separate from the stretch code that you're, we're talking about criteria four, which has to do with vehicles. Okay. Um, so criteria four, which is the vehicle purchasing policy, it, I can send that to you and I will send that to you. I'll follow up with Christian um, and send you the actual policy if you wanna take a look at it. Um, you have to meet certain um, miles per gallon for the vehicle. Uh, you mentioned the fire department. If those vehicles are being used for, um, what's the term? If they're being used for um, emergency response, then they're right. exempt from the policy. Okay. So the assistant chief was here today in a very old surplus vehicle at my offices because we had a fire alarm go off. Mm -hmm. We think a spider. And, uh, you know, he showed up in a very old vehicle. I was talking to him about it, and that's a surplus vehicle. I think it's 15 years old. El, you know, a standard old police car. If, you know. if they're using it for, for, emergen mm -hmm. for emergency response, it's exempt. He had his lights on. <laughs> <laughs> Lights were on, so I think that would qualify. I'll okay. send you the policy, and sure. um, you know, if you have any questions about her, if you want to look at your fleet, uh, it it um, I'm I'm more than happy to answer any questions if you think it might not work or, or work with it. All right, Amy, do you need a motion for the plan for the finance committee rather? Because we didn't vote on it, we we held off, correct? That's correct. All right, I'll make a motion for the finance committee that we vote to support this. I'll second that. Okay. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 So my thanks to Mark, my thanks to Will uh, for working overtime and yep. um, thank you finance committee. Yep. Thanks for answering our questions. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for thank you for having us. Mark and Will. Thank thanks everyone. And can I get a motion from the select board please? I make a motion we accept this and second. Seconded by Christian. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. I look forward to working with you all through this. Um, I, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Mark. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. All right, David, that looks like it's it, huh? That's it. All right. Um, any last words for the tri board from the finance committee or the school department? Uh, maybe we could uh, talk to, as a group, talk to the school department too, just to see where their thoughts are. If there's going to be any, um, I know that because UMass didn't go back, they did a whole new scrub on how they were saving money. If our school and our students don't go back, have you thought about any other ways to save money? Um, just wanted to throw something out there and just have a discussion maybe about it. Yeah, so um, I have been thinking as the town's been talking about this and since the last uh, tri-board meeting, 
Uh, we are currently in the process of revising the current year's budget right now. Um, so the short answer is, I and I think I can confidently speak on behalf of the school committee, although ultimately it's their decision to, um, to vote on a revised budget, but I feel confident saying that we would actively seek anything we could do to try to assist the town. I, um, but right now we're just in the process of revising FY21. It's just pretty early right now, um, Amy, in terms of sorting out what, um, what ultimately we'll, we'll end up spending. Um, but I'm optimistic. And um, again, to the extent that then um, this optimism can translate into being of assistance to the town, that would be a priority for us. Um, we're keenly aware of how supportive the town has been of the schools. So actively isn't looking this, right now. Isn't, this kind, of, isn't okay. this kind of fluid, Annie, um, where are, you're in the process now of trying to decide whether to go back to school full time or not? Um, you're doing hybrid right now with some com kids going in for IEPs and things of that nature. Um, we're still kind of waiting for, for you and, and the school department to decide uh, what does that look like? Uh, we're coming into October now. Any thoughts on, on what that looks like for, from you? Yeah, so currently um, we are, we have, we, students will, our plan is that students as the Department of Elementary and, Edu uh, Elementary and Secondary Education requested that we do, I'm sorry folks, you're gonna take a walk with me to turn off the stove. That's embarrassing, but that's a tomato that's baking and going off the stove. <laughs> Right, so this is great because this will be what's on YouTube. Uh, let's try to turn the timer off now. Good deal. Uh, okay, so now we're done baking that tomato. Uh, we, our goal is to have 100% of students whose families would like to send their children to in-person learning, we would like to have them in person. And uh, if the current health metrics hold, I imagine that that will be the recommendation of the school committee in the superintendent weekly newsletter that I share with the town administrator and with the select board, you can see that things are looking very good right now in Hampshire County. So if that were to continue, our expectation is actually that we have the option of 100% in learning five days a week. So I just wanna clarify that unlike um, other schools perhaps that are 100% remote until January or limited populations until January. That is not our plan and it has never been the plan of the school department. Um, but it doesn't mean that given the fact that we received some funding um, from, from the state and the town received some funding from the state that we've been able to use to do some of our COVID-19 preparation um, that we, we can, we're still looking at where we could potentially save money. And I'll say again, very eager to be supportive of the town, but it's, it's really early because we're only, as far as having students in school, we just entered week three, I think, right? Yep. Week three with students back. Yep. yep. So that's, that's really important. And I think you're doing a great job. Um, from what I'm understanding, it's not easy to be doing uh, virtual with children at home. Certainly it's a lot easier in, in school, but I know that you're doing everything for the safety of all children. So I appreciate that. Um, Thank you, Trace. What needs to be looked at, and I'm all in support, um, any which way that you can do that. Not every family is gonna send their children back to school. We know that. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna do the best that we can to support all, all of our kids in any which way that we can. So the budget is gonna be fluid for you. Um, it's kind of not fair to ask you at this point how it's going to pan out until we actually know what the numbers are and that we can see what happens in the next few weeks when kids are able to come back to school and have that opportunity. I appreciate that, but we are definitely, thank you for that patience and understanding. We are definitely looking 
um, mm -hmm. to see. I, 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 I don't want to hear that the town is struggling and certainly um, the school department is one department in the town. So we definitely want to be team players and figure out what we can do to help. Well, as, as I've said from the day I got on school committee right through all these years that our students are our future. So no matter which way that we look at it, they're the ones that are going to be here when I'm long gone. So we want to support these kids in any which way that we can. And just for comic relief, so everyone can know, I turned off the oven and the timer, but I left the dish in the oven. So if you could give me a minute, I've got to go. I'm burning it. I mean, I'll be here, but give me a second. Don't burn your dinner. <laughs> uh. All right. Any, uh, anything further from finance or uh, from the schools? Good. And uh, Ethan, if you could find $700,000 hanging around Hopkins somewhere, we would appreciate it. <laughs> All right. I heard, it's buried, I heard it might be buried in the common. Yeah, we can start digging. <laughs> start digging. Was, there, was there any update on the completion of the fields at all? They look great if uh, folks have been out there. So um, if they have had a chance, we're, I want to say within the next couple of weeks, that phase will be wrapped up. Ethan, if I'm not remembering correctly from last school committee, you can correct me. But I think phase one uh, will be wrapped up. We still have to stay off the fields because of planting and letting them rest and um, uh, a whole bunch of other reasons. But uh, they look great. They look yeah. great. Yeah, Half so around that path, it's delightful. Yeah, so the fields aren't going to get used this year, but for next year or the spring is what we're looking at. Right, so there'll be a phasing in of when we'll move various, well, when we can, depending on what the recommendations are around sports and spring sports, and we'll have to see what the department says and mass and uh, the Interscholastic Athletic Association says about what sports we can actually play and under what conditions, but no, we wouldn't be using them this spring, so there'd be some sort of rotation, and then I yeah, would be preparing to use them next year. Yeah, great. Thank you. It looks great. Yeah, it does. One quick thing I just wanted to bring up uh, as a consideration for the schools uh, with snow and snowmobile season showing up soon. Um, if you really need people off those fields, you may want to find a way to warn people from the path coming from Middle Street because the usual snowmobile traffic will be coming. So. Right, thank you for bringing that up. I know that Paul Pfeiffer, who's kind of our point person, uh, school committee member who's the point person on the fields, has been in communication with David Nixon about how he can um, make sure that there's kind of, I guess there's a club in town and getting that word out. But thank you for that reminder. We have school committee tomorrow and between me and Ethan, I'm sure we can remember to, <laughs> to talk to Paul about that. Thank you. Is right, it at all possible to put up snow fences so that they can't cross the field? All right, so here's my stupid question. Are snow fences those beautiful orange fences? Yeah. But, okay, then they're up, because I was trying to get down there today, and I thought they put them up just to keep me <laughs> off there, Joyce, but who knew? I thought it was the Annie McKenzie fence, and it's a snow fence. Yay. So, yeah. <laughs> That'll help. Super. I think that will help deter them a little bit to not go on to those fields we have up some type of fencing for them. Okay, anything further for tribe work? All right, thanks there's no, nothing else. Uh, thanks everybody for showing up and that'll, we'll move on to the rest of the agenda. Thank, Thank you, you. I've, I've embarrassed myself enough tonight. Thank you all, appreciate it. We'll see you soon. <laughs> Enjoy you. supper. <laughs> all right, so we're gonna go ahead and jump down to the, we'll do the library uh update status update first because we have some people here uh engineers and whatnot that are here for that purpose and they've waited long enough um so christian do you want to start off with a little update since i think you're the point person here yeah yeah um you know i can kind of turn it over to mark and phil i don't know who wants to speak uh for sure first but basically you know we just invited the opm and architect here to discuss just some of the design slash on-site changes um, that happened with the parking lot that we were talking about last week and just kind of get an update from them, you know, where it's at and their perspective. I saw them working there today. So um, 
looks like there's progress being made, but maybe you guys have a little more to say about it. Oh, you might be on mute, Mark. If... Sorry. Um, I'll jump in and, and or start, and then Phil can jump in on the, on the design um, elements. But basically, the curb repair work, which you uh, learned about last week, um, the initial quotes that we got from the site contractor through the general contractor were uh, were extreme. That's why we didn't formally, uh, a formal proposal wasn't forwarded to the building committee because we, Phil and, and, and our office rejected it before it ever got that far. But in the meantime, the word got out, the issue became what it was and it was discussed last week at, at the select board and so forth, which is fine. But in the meantime, or in the time since, uh, we were able to negotiate the number down from the, I think initially it was 42,000. Then the uh, Phil's engineering team looked at it um, revised it, kicked it back. It got down to the $25,000 range. And as of this morning at our building, uh, at our regular um, job meeting with the general contractor, uh, they're trying to get the work has started today. They think it'll be done before the weekend. Uh, so the issue physically will be behind us. They're gonna, the paving is scheduled. The final paving is scheduled for, I think the 12th, the week from Monday. Um, and the final price tag looks to be right around $20,000. So um, it's roughly a little less than half dollar-wise, cost-wise uh, of an issue than it was uh, this time last week. Okay, so it's a he said, who said, we did whatever, um, you know, and I'm very happy that it's getting rectified. It should be just for the safety of that area uh, in the buildings. Um, I don't think we have to, you know, it's not like going into a subdivision or of whatnot, but um, certainly for the safety of our fire trucks getting in and out of there. Um, any thoughts on um, actually who has been responsible or where that all came from with the drawings or anything like that? Can any of that be can you shed any light on that for us? Well, I think people had questions about that. Sure. Um, so well, so I'll, I'll give you, go ahead, Phil. Um, I can, I can kind of catch up on the history the way that we understand it. Um, from our point of view, uh, we did a study w working with the library uh, a number of years ago and helped to apply for a grant. Um, at that point, it was not anticipated that there would be another building behind us. Our grant application drawings showed a green field back there. Um, at some point between the time that we did the study and we were asked to help do the final design when the grant was awarded, um, we heard about the senior center. Uh, the senior center was actually ahead of us uh, and they did some design work. You will probably recall that the senior center was far enough ahead of us that they attempted to go to the planning board with uh, to get their site plan approval before we had gotten to that point where we could catch up with them. They actually presented a plan at the planning board um, that showed uh, the driveways in and out. Um, they showed basically a rectangle that represented the library and they may have showed some parking um, or a guesstimate at the parking um, and basically said that this was gonna be built out later. So basically they attempted to do what you might do if you were doing a strip mall and you were gonna do a um, approve something for a pad site for a, another store or something that would be built at a later date. Uh, the planning board didn't like that. And so basically we, we um, they held back a little bit, this, the senior center design committee, and we kind of speeded up on the, C, uh, on the civil engineering portion of our project and basically began to work with them uh, as a team to design the, the site plan together because we needed to permit it together. Now, that being said, we did work closely together. Uh, they did send us some of their initial uh, documents that they had worked through. Um, and in their conversations between, uh, between the design teams, uh, our engineers noticed that the driveways coming in were narrower than 20 feet and asked the other engineers if they had checked that with the fire department and they said that they had, and as long as uh, we could do a swept path analysis uh, that would show that the trucks could move through the site safely, then the fire department would be okay with that. Um, based on that, 
we, we designed uh, the plan for the library project in conjunction with the senior center project uh, based on that information. Um, I don't have any evidence that my engineers independently checked that with the fire department, but they, they did act on that information in good faith uh, and based on what they understood was the wishes of the town and the authorities having jurisdiction, in this case, the fire department. Um, the test was when we went to the planning board and again applied for a permit uh, that whether or not we would, would pass. Um, it was our understanding that this was accepted by the fire department and then we made it through those two approval processes. Um, again, there is some flexibility in the code uh, depending on how you're using these spaces and how you're using these driveways. Uh, that some of their exceptions include driveways very similar to ours that don't immediately abut the building uh, and they can be as narrow as 16 feet. Um, it was based on this flexibility in the code that we understood um, we were getting uh, relief from uh, the fire department and then we felt that that was um, signed off on when we were permitted um, and approved by the planning board. Uh, in other words, I think we did what we were asked to do. Uh, I think we did it in good faith. Um, and I think we tried to design a, a, a building that met the requirements for you all and uh, is safe. The building did pass the swept path analysis. Um, in other words, the way it was designed originally with the narrower driveways, the trucks can get in safely. Um, and move around. Uh, I don't think that um, they ever tested that uh, to show that it wouldn't work. Uh, I don't think I actually I think the fire department offered to do that but the contractor said that the site was actually too crowded with material in order to be able to get that done. Um, I will say that because it was reviewed in a in under construction um, condition the curbs were really high uh, set off of the base coat of the paving in a lot of cases. Um, that uh, certainly tends to kind of neck things down in terms of the way that they appear. And it was designed to have much less kind of overall uh, height above the finished paving when we're done. So that um, the bumpers of larger vehicles could pass over the curb if they needed to. Uh, the swept path analysis actually showed that that only needed to happen in very few places in order for that to, to come together. Um, so when the fire department expressed concern about this as they have actually a couple of other things that were originally approved uh we went about uh doing the documents that would uh that were required to modify this we did the engineering and we went over to the planning board and we had that approved and that approval from the planning board uh required the sign off of four different other departments in town including this board uh, the select board and we've secured that and authorized them to proceed uh, based on an understanding that we would come to an agreement on a, on a price that Mark Sullivan and his office and our, my office felt was fair. And I think with the number that we were given this morning, that does sound fair for the work that, they're, that they've uh, agreed to undertake. And we would recommend that amount. Um, and uh, we are expecting them to revise their change order proposal and submit that to us. And then we will present that to you all. Okay, thank you for your rendition of how it all came about. I appreciate that. You bet. Uh, so I guess right now we've given the go ahead to do the work. And right now the money's coming out of the library's uh, contingency fund, correct? Right. Yeah. All right. So I'm gonna, I'm going to make a motion that we accept this. Um, I'm pleased that they did come down with their price. Um, things happen when construction. Um, these things happen, and I'm glad to see that they rectify. I would just like some uh, approval. You know, I, I guess you did you get approval from the fire chief and stuff with this with the new part. I guess that's. Uh, that's the only question I have, and I'll make a motion to accept this proposal at twenty thousand uh, dollars. Just to be clear on on two points, we did get an approval from the from the fire department. That was one of the requirements of the planning board's approval. Um, fire department, building department, DPW, and the select board all needed to say okay, and you all have 
Um, the second thing is that this was the $20,000 number is based on a discussion we had with the contractor today. Mark and I have not yet seen a written proposal. Um, and so uh, while I appreciate your motion, uh, we are not in a position where we can recommend that as a hard number until we have it in writing from them, unfortunately. Okay, well, I'll, I'll recommend the reduced rate uh, coming in with in near. Um, how soon would you might get that written written up? I think we do have a meeting next week on the seventh. Is that correct, David? Do you think we might have those numbers for next week, Mark? It's it's possible. We could certainly ask them to do that for us. I would think okay. so. the, the work was physically like it's supposed to be done Friday, so they should be able to wrap everything up and get us the final cost. Okay, and I would I would be more than happy to uh, make that motion uh, next week when I, we have the final numbers in front of us. So I just want to make sure that I, my understanding was there was some application that needed to go before the fire chief uh, to ask about the road width. Uh, I'm not sure on which side of the building that is still slightly less than code. So although he said it is okay to do, I think there's a formal process that has not yet been initiated is my understanding. What, what the fire chief has asked us to do, and I have an email that, that says this, is he's asked us to write a letter uh, explaining that there is one section that still has uh, a driveway that, has, uh, that is 18 feet wide and that it's acceptable to him and he would like us to write to him and, uh, and point that out and ask for him to waive the 20 foot requirement in that area, which he said he would do. He also said that he could, uh, we could send that letter as part of a closeout documentation. Um, and when we get to the point where they have their certificate of occupancy, one of the things that we'll produce is uh, construction control affidavits for the fire department and for the, um, the building department. And as part of that submission, we'll include that letter. Okay. Okay. So making a motion on this for next week would be okay? Hang on, George. Um, there was one more issue with the DPW about a, an abandoned uh, catch basin. Has that been addressed? That work, as far as I understand, has not been done yet, but the plan is that it will be done before they finish. Right. Because they set curb right on top of the pipe they're supposed to pull out. So I just want to uh, reaffirm that that's going to be addressed. It, it will be. That's one of the things that Mark and I discussed with them today at our morning's meeting. Um, the, the site super tells us that the pipe, it doesn't actually sit directly underneath the curb uh, and the curb is being moved. And then once they finish over there, they, they will remove that pipe. In other words, with the, part of the concern I think from DPW was that they were gonna place curb over the pipe and do compaction and he was afraid of a collapse and so forth. Um, that is not the case according to what the, the super tells us. Okay. okay. Any plan uh, that was to address the curb repairs now, do that pipe uh, repair, and then do the final paving uh, a week from Monday, which is the 12th. Okay. Sounds good. Any further updates on the library? I, I, if anybody hasn't seen it, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd recommend taking a peek. Um, we're, very, we're very proud of what we've been able to do, and the place looks great. It looks great from the outside, that's for sure. And there's a, yeah. a sight line that goes from the library down to the senior center. And it's really kind of neat to look down that row and see both of those buildings. They look great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did, a, we did a rendering once upon a time that showed those two things. And uh, yeah, it looks I'm happy to see that, that it looks even better in person. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to take if you're a coming out of the senior center, it's a great view down the walkway to the library. Uh -huh. Oh, good. Yeah. I, haven't, uh, I haven't driven that way yet. In, oh, in come on, Philip. You can do that. <laughs> well, the, park, the parking lot's only just been open for me to be able to drive through, but I haven't driven Oh, there. come on. We've been driving through it for months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. It all looks good. Thank you. And, and thank you, John Furman. Uh, Mark, or, uh, could you just remind the guys on site, we had a one, I know it's going to bound to happen eventually, but we had a flat tire uh, there the other day and just oh. kind of make sure that we're policing up nails and last minute debris that's there. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Are they doing curbing 
on Middle Street that go coincides with this library? Or are uh, we doing curbing on Middle Street? Who's doing the curbing on Middle Street? That's that's the library that's doing the entrance. Sir, it's already there. They're moving the entrance right now, Joyce. To okay. Make, yeah. Make twenty foot sweep. Okay. Yeah, we're just Thank we're you. just sweeping the driveways into the existing curb. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Anything else on the library? Nope. I just want to thank uh, Phil and Mark for coming tonight and uh, presenting to us. Thank you. That was really helpful. Sure. Thanks. 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 Very appreciative to be here. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. And uh, all right, we'll see you. And then uh, let's move on. Let's hit the uh, senior center and fire station while, while we're here talking about these projects. Thank you all. Uh, like one more thing on a library, David. Uh, not not for you guys. Uh, okay. But, uh, <laughs> no, I'd like to thank the uh, a butter, uh, Mr. Bakula. Me and uh, Jane went over and met with him, and he was very appreciative. Uh, someone, no one, had contacted him throughout the two years of this project. That kind of disturbs me a little bit. Uh, when I volunteered to go over, I thought there was a possible issue between one person and another, but there wasn't. They were, he was just not approached. He was very, uh, very happy to have us there, and he agreed to have the trees trimmed up. And the DPW, Scott, went right over there after we had our meeting and trimmed them up. And that property line looks 100% better than it did when we started over there. Great. Thank you, John. Jane? All right, Joyce, what are you going over there? Well, the substation is uh, waiting for Omasta to get back up there and do some seating. We've just uh, haven't had time, or uh, they haven't, uh, to get up there and redo some lime. They've limed up there, but we need to water. So we've told them that we would do that, so that we're in the process of doing that to make that grass look a little bit better because it sure doesn't look good now. It looks like uh, crab grass more than anything else. Um, we're taking things off of one truck to put on another so that truck will be going into that fire station. So they're just trying to put equipment and things in there now and uh, within the next couple of weeks, uh, you know, probably will be all set to go. Is there any, any word on the water ban? Because when I talked to Chris Okafer, he said he would have further news on the 29th, which was yesterday. I've been on Chris on a weekly basis because of the calls that I get. And uh, unfortunately, the state has, um, uh, they've actually been pushing for more restrictions because up until yesterday, we've actually gone further into a drought than we had been. So um, I haven't gotten the latest as of yesterday, but I will check into it tomorrow and uh, we'll let you know. Thank you. It helped a little bit with what we got last night, that's for sure. Yeah, we got an inch and a half last night. I mean, better late than never, but it's, it's not going to. Yeah, it helps. Overall picture, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and just, just so people are aware, it, this isn't an issue of the town running out of water. We have plenty of water in the ground. This is just uh, to comply with our um, uh, permits from DEP of how much water we can pull out of the ground in any particular day. So that, that's the reason for this. It's not like we're risking running dry with our wells. So. Yeah, that's, that's why we need to get that pump test on Mount Warner rolling here and, and mm -hmm. get that get those other two pumps back in service at some point. In the yeah, time. give us more water for sure. Yeah. Uh, Jane, did you have anything from the senior center? Uh, we're still waiting for a master to recede also, but we're very happy, thank you. Okay, sounds good. Um, all right, let's go back up on the list here. Let's jump to the um, 7.1, Russell School backstop and fence removal. Um, You'll notice that the bushes have disappeared by the parking lot across from Town Hall. Um, the DPW has been over there patching the lawn, trying to neaten the place up a little bit, and this will kind of go into our next conversation as well. But what the DPW is asking to do is to remove the rusted backstop on the baseball field that doesn't exist anymore, it's just a grass field, and also the fence along Route 9 
to kind of make the place look a little better and less like an abandoned construction site. Um, also, it would save a little bit of labor with having to weed whack up and down the fence each time they mow. Um, Jane brought up that uh, the fence is a good spot to put signage when we have events in town. And so I've asked um, Chris and Gary to work on a solution of some sort that we could put on the corner there that would still support putting up signs. Um, Chris said that he would rather remove uh, the entire fence rather than just leave one section for signage, but they're open to the idea of coming up with a way that is um, visually appealing to, to still dis display those banners and whatnot that we like to put up there. So um, looking to remove both of those. I'll make a motion to remove both of those. I think it's time to clean that area up and make it more presentable for the center of town. I can second. Okay. And one quick note, I did check with Tommy, the, um, the slope on that little bit of a hill there is not steep enough where there, there, there's no fence required along Russell School there. So we're, we're safe as far as code goes because of the hill, so. Okay, I have a suggestion given our financial status. Yes. And that is that even though it may not be their idea, we leave a couple of sections of fence because it won't cost us anything to leave it as opposed to putting up something different. Until until we're in a better place or they have something that's basically free. I want to see why you wouldn't believe maybe two or three sections. You can just tie it off to whatever post they end up at and pull the rest of them out. All right, so what do you think? Two, two sections should probably be enough? I think so, especially if we, in the past, there have been out of town events that are not held in Hadley. And I think we might consider limiting that at this point for who's advertising on that fence and keep okay. it in house things, so to speak, or in town things. If an outside group is doing something in Hadley, like the Asparagus Festival, fine, or Kestrel, but to have various other organizations that are having their own church suppers or whatever, I think is inappropriate. If we, especially if we have a limited space. Most of them come to the board for permission anyway to, to put their signs up on. That well, they, they don't come to the board anymore, John. They go to the administrator and he gives yeah. the yay or nay. Yeah. Could, could we just leave up a couple of posts and then just tie a rope between the two posts so then the chain link's not there and you probably wouldn't even notice the posts are, are there. It's harder to put signs on that because signs come in all different sizes. Yeah. Having put many signs on the posts. I'm just thinking it's going to look weird with the just the 20 foot section or 10 foot section of fence. That's all. But I don't think that'll look good. We can try it. If we don't like it, we'll change it. Yeah, exactly. It yeah. Let's leave it and try it. All right. So can we amend the motion to uh, leave up two sections of fence and go from there? Correct. Let's do the closer ones towards Middle Street. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of them can come down. And the backstop as well. Correct. Okay. That's and, my uh, We had a second from Jane, right? Yes. Okay. Any further discussion? Yeah, I was actually thinking of two a little further down because the three and a corner, you've got one going down Middle Street and the two first two going down Route 9 by the PVTA bus stop are really, it's a nasty corner to plow to start with. And if you've got those two out of the corner and say the third one and the fourth one, you'd say, you know. So how about we let uh, Scott, when he's there tomorrow, make the call and, and yeah, do exactly. as close I, to I, Middle Street as possible. Yeah, but it, if you I, just, just up that intersection for that sidewalk, because the hydrant's right there, the light poles are right there, and you can't get much of a machine in there to push the snow back on that corner. Let's that just do, sense. let's just do two sections and let Scott determine which way. All right. All right. Well, well, route nine, not Middle Street. As well, I, did, I didn't want him on Middle Street. I said Route Nine. The two sections on Route Nine that were closest to Middle Street. Yeah. Right. Was fine. Not on um, not on Middle Street itself, but the ones that were closest to the uh, intersection. 
there's only one section that goes down Middle Street. And that was just because the kids would run out of school towards the intersection when they were going for lunch to hook for school at one time. Yeah. So they wouldn't run out in the road. That's why that little leg was put in there. Yeah. Okay. Motion and second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And my computer locked. We've been talking about this for so long. Um, <laughs> uh, all right. Russell School discussion. Um, last night, the Municipal Building Committee voted uh, regarding the future of Russell School. And so let me pull up the separate email. It's not in board docs. I'll, I'll read it so that way you can know what the decision was. Um, all right, so per the request of the select board, the NBC held a vote regarding the future of Russell School. Uh, the following motion was approved unanimously. MBC is not in favor of a full renovation of Russell School for town use at this time. Uh, this is based on two facts. The first, the town has no clear future use uh, or need of the space. And second, the cost for a complete renovation is too costly, uh, somewhere in the range of 22 to $30 million. Uh, number two, the majority of the building committee recommends mothballing the building for a period of up to 10 years. Number three, the majority of the committee is urging the select board for more time, a cutoff date of February 14th to review costs to either mothball the building or for demolition. The town is also awaiting the outcome of obtaining a grant, which will enable the town to explore the possibility of partnering with either a private or a nonprofit entity. This avenue could possibly allow for the renovation to be completed by a private source, which might allow the cost to be excluded from prevailing wages. Number four, NBC is requesting the select board to uh, favor a survey to be sent out prior to the spring town meeting in order to obtain the pulse of the residents. This survey shall include uh, Number five, NBC requests the support from the select board to obtain CPA funding if the consensus is to mothball the building. So, um, what I would like to do, and, and my recommendation is we pursue these avenues at the same time because this has been kicked down the road for quite some time and you know we've been studying and studying and not doing much so what i'd like to do is put out a broad rfp as soon as we can get one together and see if there's any interest from nonprofits, private sector whatever let them make a pitch for, to us let them do the legwork and decide whether or not the building is worth you know them spending the money to renovate and maybe we can lease it for 50 years, 99 years, whatever it is. Uh, that way we hold on to that valuable land at the center of town. Um, at the same time, I've got, uh, Gary's gonna go out and get multiple quotes on asbestos abatement and the cost to tear down the building. So we have a solid number on that because we've heard all kinds of ranges of you know $200,000 to tear it down to 2 million. So, those two options. The other option, um, we're waiting on a community development block grant, I believe it is, for $75,000 to study what other possible uses of the building are out there. You know, what else could we possibly do? Um, and also getting a solid cost on mothballing the building. So uh, the issue with mothballing, obviously, for 10 years or five years, it's both have been discussed is there's going to be some cost associated with that. Um, the best estimates I've seen is somewhere between one and $2 million. Um, so, you know, if we could do CPA funding, something like that to save a historic building, that'd be nice. It wouldn't add to, you know, the tax rate directly, but I don't know that CPA or town meeting would support that. And so if we go down that path and we get to town meeting floor, and the voters say no to using $2 million or, or some amount of CPA money, you know, that option's off the table. And then we're looking at either demolition or leasing it to somebody. Those, those are, in my mind, the options that we have to look at. And I know Alan is here and I think, uh, is that Gary building admin? So if, if I missed anything, chime in.
Okay, I'm gonna have to figure out how to unmute now. All right. Is, is that Gary uh, doing admin? He's not talking. No, I'm not talking. Okay, yeah, well, I was at, I was at the uh, NBC meeting and uh, that that's a, an accurate description of the discussion and the uh, and the decision and the recommendation about going forward. And it's basically, it's a multiple front kind of a thing. It's, there's a number of things we need to do to try to get somewhere with this building. Um, um, and uh, it gets complicated with the, um, with some of the, um, the recommendations, like the feasibility study that we're, that we're waiting to hear if it's funded would be very useful to have some kind of a, a study of what the options would look like. And, and it's useful not just for the town to, um, for the town to know what might be realistic, but it's also useful when you go out with an RFP for the people who we are asking if they're interested in using the building, it, it informs their thinking as well. And, and I base this on, um, we, I looked at, oh, it must be 20 to 30 other communities, most of them in, in Massachusetts who have done, who've had the same situation, old schools or town halls that they don't need, they can't, they're not interested in putting any more money in, into it for town use. And, and they go through a process of, of determining what to do with it. And the, and the most common strategy has been, you do a feasibility study, which can go, and by the way, the cost I think is uh, for the CDBG study is something like, was it $70,000, Carolyn, is that? Yeah, which is way high in my opinion. Uh, I've seen them done for you know less than 20. Um, but to have that study done, and it depends on how you do the scope of work. That's how you can, you know, keep it reasonable. Um, I think um, uh, Low Pioneer Valley, who would probably be doing this study, did a similar one for the center school in Hatfield two or three years ago. I don't know how much it cost, but when I looked at that study, I said, you know, 60% of it is stuff that we already knew or that the town already knew. A lot of it is just padding, I think. Um, the one that was done for the East Street School in Amherst by Coon Riddle for the Amherst Affordable Trust thing was done for $10,000. And I thought that was a better study, to be honest with you. It was more focused. But, um, you know, we don't, you don't have to do a feasibility study to do an RFP. But if, you did, if we did have a feasibility study done, it would help uh, design the RFP and help inform the RFP and it would help inform the town and it would help uh, it would help the prospective people who might be interested in, in uh, doing something with the building. So that, that's typically done, and not, not always, but it's typically done in the towns. And then an RFP is done, as David mentioned, and I, I do like the idea of doing that. The timing of it is the, is the question. Do you want to do that before or after the feasibility study? Do you want to wait until you do a community survey to find out what the folks are th thinking uh, you know, would be acceptable? because that would inform your RFP too. You don't want to put an RFP out there and have people throw in suggestions that's not going to fly in town. So it, it's a multiple kind of a multi-pronged thing. It's like three-dimensional chess, but the key elements are a feasibility study, an RFP, a community survey or public forum. If you can do those things, and we, this, these are the things we, would, we discussed in the subcommittee doing last, last spring until the COVID just stopped us dead in our tracks. So we would have liked to have done those kinds of things then. But um, here we are, it is what it is, as they say, and we have to, I think we still have some time to investigate what the options could be through these mechanisms that have been discussed. And then that goes hand in hand with looking at what would it cost, what would the real cost be if we did have to demo, demo the building, because it's not gonna be for free for sure. Um, and, uh, and, and the stabilization um, element of this, stabilizing the exterior of the building to keep it standing for the next how many years while we are in the process of trying to lease it or possibly sell it, that's also a common element in the other towns that, that uh, I looked at. Um, most of the other towns already put CPA money into buildings that they had no use for, then they didn't know what they were going to do with it, but they knew, and, and this 
pans out in reality, especially with a building like Russell, where you know you're going to have to, it's going to be multiple millions to renovate that building that if the town isn't willing to step up and, and put some money in to keep the building stabilized and to, and to help, you know, to incentivize, incentivize the uh, leasing of the building by, by doing, using CPA money, it's gonna be less likely you're gonna get anybody interested in doing anything with the building. So it's sort of our, it'd be the town's contribution to making it happen. The problem is sometimes it's hap it, it, that happens before you know that there's a real person out there who's interested in the building. But that's, that's my risk, I think, that the town needs to think about doing. So all those things that we talked about and that I'm throwing out there are, are to me, are, are, are elements. We can go, some of them, all of them, we can do this simultaneously. They're not mutually exclusive. I think we, if we were looking at um, you know, getting a good handle on this by spring town meeting, which I think is reasonable, then we need to move on some of these things now and uh, stop putting them together. So what I'd like to do is, and personally, I'd like to take it off the table of selling the building. I think that that land at the center of town um, is, is way too valuable to the future uses of the town, whether it's a new town hall down the line, uh, some kind of school building, who knows what we're gonna need you know, 50 or 100 years from now. And it is the town center. So, um, yeah. Personally, I, I don't favor selling the building. I think, you know, mothballing, leasing, uh, tearing it down are, are, are our best options. But um, I, I just think the land, you can't get it back. So, so, so what are you saying? If we do an IRFP, we're not going to entertain a sale? No, I'd like to see a lease, whether it's a 50-year, 99-year lease, something like that. And, and, yeah, and that can be done. I mean, that's what they the, did the, in the Amherst. They put that out. They didn't get many uh, bidders for it. But the fact is, my understanding, and again, the, uh, the people of Valley CDC have done this before, they tell me that a 99-year lease is, is just the same from a financing point of view as, as a sale of the building. You can get financing, and that's what these people want to, to know, is can they get financing, and a lease can do that. So um, I know in many of the other towns, they, they ended up selling the, the building and the land. So, and, and I agree that I, I would prefer not to do that. This is a very, very important site in town. This isn't just a parcel stuck, stuck in a backwood somewhere. Um, and we certainly want to have control of what, what happens there. But so I think, if, you know, you could put it out there with, with, with a lease provision, but I think we'd have to understand it would have to be a long-term lease, not something like year to year. Um, yeah, no one's going to drop, you know, $20 million on the building for a you bet. Years, so so uh, can I, can I just chime in on this for a second? Cause I was on school committee when we were in the process of building a new elementary school. Uh, we did a feasibility uh, report on Russell school. Uh, it was a firm out of Greenfield. It was a woman. And I can't remember her name because God only knows it's been too many years for me to oh, think. That Jones. Far. Jones. Jones. Yes. They did the architect. Did, have you seen the report on that? I, I did. I do remember seeing it. Yes. Yeah, so that basically tells you that that building is sinking. Um, and one reason why it's not really going to be feasible for us to lease it in the condition that it's in and be responsible in the liability of it. Um, there are a lot of things going on on the inside of that building that, you know, a lot of this stuff, we need to look back on that report. Yes, you can do another feasibility study. That's not a problem to That's see where we are now from over, it's 20 years since we built the elementary school. And so there's many years before that, that we did that feasibility study. So I would suggest that we take and compare if we're going to do a feasibility study, compare the two, two, two studies and see just what is, is the difference between the two. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I think that's, that's a good point, uh, Joyce, but th that's not the only study that was done. Mohawk did a study. DRA did a study. They Mohawk all say that... Who? Mohawk who? Mo Mohawk, uh, what are they? They do... They do oh, yeah. they, 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 they're the yeah. ones who did, did the um, preservation, building preservation study. Same yeah, time that it was called Old Mohawk. That's yeah. it, Old Mohawk. Yeah, that's what, that was yeah. a good study. Yes, yeah. I, I think it's an exaggeration though to say that the building is sinking. It's, it's, well, the, it's, it's part of the foundation, especially on the west side. There's some problems. There's some problems there. 
they're not impossible to fix. Um, and that's what one of the things that the CPA money could address. But the, fe the feasibility study that I've been talking about isn't to look at what the condition of the building is. We know it's, you know, it needs work. The feasibility study is what, you know, if you did fix it up, what could it be used for? Offices, schools, housing, the, you know, those kinds of things. So it's not, a, it's not another structural engineering report or, 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 or a renovation report. So I don't think we'd be reinventing the wheel. And, and obviously those things would inform and they're out there. For anybody who did a, any more analysis of what you could use the building for, those reports are, are still useful. So I, I've got Gary working on the uh, demo uh, cost estimates for us. Uh, so he's, he's already running on that. Um, I would like the board to authorize uh, Carolyn and Jennifer to put out a RFP um, as soon as possible to see what we can get as far as proposals and, you know, on, on a lease and use of the building. And then if, you know, maybe if something decent comes in, we can work with the planning board and see what's allowed and what, what could be possible. But on the other hand, if we get nothing back, that would also give us an indication of what direction we have to go. And then um, I, I guess uh, Gary and, and the building committee could work on getting us some solid costs on mothballing the building. And, you know, once we have that, then we can work on a funding source, whether that's CPA or whatever. But and if you're, but if you're going to lease the building and do all that, David, you got to fix what's happening on the inside, whether that be, it needs a new furnace, it needs new pipes, it's got asbestos. I mean, there are a lot of things in there that you cannot rent to people with nowadays. So it, it again, be, that's something that... Uh, if I could just throw in there, the, the RFPs that I've seen um, were for in, people who might be interested in using the building and fixing it up. Yeah. They, they'd have to invest in it. Yeah. The, the, the lease is, the, is that's, the, that's what we would agree to, that's how we would agree to let them have the building, the long-term lease. Yeah, there's there's no way that we can afford like to. the center of town hall. Exactly, and that worked out well for for them. Um, you know, it's a nice restaurant and whatnot. So um, yes, exactly. That, although they sold that building, that wasn't a lease. But uh, yeah, so but I mean, it could have been a lease. So so what I'm looking for is is if we could get authorization to put out that RFP as soon as possible and see what we get. Can I get a motion to that effect, please? So moved. Yeah. Okay. Second. Second by, was that by Joyce? Yeah. Okay. Any further discussion on an RFP? Yes. I think that we're going to run into the, the same problem we did with the North Hadley Hall regarding the ball, ball field. And we should apply for chapter 95 or whatever it is right now for that ball field and apply it to the Hopkins fields. We have that option. So we have, yeah. Yeah, we have time to do that. I think New fields going in. Yeah, we have time to do that, I think, on this town meeting since we haven't closed, I mean, we haven't signed the warrant yet and finalized it. Is oh, that good. something to do? Yeah, that was one of the recommendations so I, think, I had. I think we should do that as, I, this is just part of, not this motion, but conversation yep. around this motion that we need to get that process started because we know how long it took on North Hadley. Absolutely, okay. So, um, so back to the motion. Okay. So any further discussion on the RFP? Uh, I'm not part of the vote, but I, I, would, I would like to offer my time in helping to put that together. Because again, we don't have a planner. Planners usually do these kinds of things. But there's, I have at least nine examples of RFPs that we could tailor to our specifications. I'd be happy to work with Carolyn or whoever you want to, you know, if, if you need the help, I'd be happy to you know, help put that together. I have to look at. I'm sure Jennifer and Carolyn would, would love the examples rather than reinventing the wheel. So, um, all right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Aye. No on John. So, 4 1. Um, next, so we've got the demolition estimate coming in. Uh, I'll get with the municipal building committee on what we need to get an estimate on mothballing the building. Um, and then the goal is to have three options to present to the public by annual town meeting in the spring and let the voters decide what they want to do. 
So at least in my mind, that's that's the path forward. So I don't know if, if anybody else has any input. Okay, I'd like to make a motion. I lost you, Jane. I'm not sure. If to make a motion to put on special town meeting. Oh, the ball transfer the ball field. Can you hear me now? Sounds better. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, I would like to make a motion that we put a transfer of uh, athletic fields from the current ball field. I, I lost you again, but I, I think we're going to have to make a motion to reopen the warrant. Correct. And then add that article to the warrant and then to make another motion to close the warrant. And Carolyn or David, correct me if David, go ahead. You got your hand up. You've not taken a vote to close the warrant. So technically the warrant is still open. Oh, perfect. So motion to add this to the uh, current warrant. For the clarity of the record, what are we adding? We're we're adding the uh, changing the 97 ball field next door to the hook, uh, pardon the Russell School, into property to be uh, maintained by Hopkins Academy. Basically, yes, the the new athletic fields in, in substituting for the current ball field by you, Russell. You, you're you're petitioning the legislature. Right. Right. Let, me do, let me do a little bit of research and we'll have an answer for you, but I will uh, reserve space on the warrant for you. Fine. Thank you. All right. So then are we, all the do, do would, we make motion in a second, first of all. Why would you need to take it out of 97 to just uh, Hopkins has been maintaining it right along? Why do you need to take it out of 97? You, you, you may want to use that ball field for parking, for instance. If, if we for, for, for town meetings. No, but if we were to lease the building or to use it for some other purpose, let, let's just say we wanted to put it into uh, something and we needed that for parking space or whatever. Uh, just like with North Hadley Hall, we couldn't do that without removing the Article 97 protection. It has to stay a, a ball field forever. I, I, I don't know if I like the rush on that just because we don't, I don't know what we're going to do with that space maybe we want to make it into a park or something in the short term and do something in the long term i don't know I, i'm feeling it's a little rush to just jump I, in to removing that article 97 restriction and yeah, i don't take, i don't really want to see i don't want to really see coprobial there either right i don't want i don't oh, i don't want to see blacktop there on route nine for that area no I, I'm going to withdraw my motion. I'm just going to say, let's keep it like it is. That's my motion um, until we have a better idea of what we're doing with Russell School. Okay. So then we've got the RFP going out. Um, we'll get a, a cost and we'll give the voters an option for spring town meeting. Correct. I, I, I'm going to just make one statement there is I think that, that that's all well and good, but this isn't North Alley Hall. This is a much more important building. And I think we we ought to at some point have some kind of a public forum or a survey that lays out everything for them, for the residents, all the options, uh, not just two or three, it may be five or six actually. And, and I don't think we're ready to do that right now, but I think we should think about, think about thinking about it before top, before spring. Exactly, I, I said it quite a few times, Alan. Those are the last three historic corners we have, the library, the town hall, the church, Russell School, and the museum. I, I don't want to see those disappear from those corners. Absolutely not. And John, how do we pay for the $20 million that we can't fix? If I had it, I would absolutely rebuild it into the town hall right now for you. <laughs> well, we better buy some lottery tickets somewhere. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> All right, I'll chip in fifty cents with you, Joyce. All right, I got I got the other fifty, John. That makes one ticket. We're good. <laughs> That's the one we need. <laughs> if you if you if you can find if you can find a partner, it has been done. If you can yep. find a partner, and if we can help them out with CPA money, 
it is possible to do it something is. with a building like that. A, a lot of other towns and cities, Al, you've been doing enough of research. Yep. These bigger towns and cities have been getting matching funds. They've been right. getting grant money. They've been getting CPA money. And they're, they're rebuilding that 20 million, 22 million, whatever, 25 million for a matter of four or five million dollars of the taxpayers' money. Yeah, and we're, I've seen we've it kind of looked into that. And they're getting matching I, I, funds. I don't know if that'll happen, but I can tell you in other cases, if it costs the town $20 million to do something, a private party who has can get, take advantage of historic tax credits yeah. and other uh, funding and not have to pay prevailing wages can do it for a heck of a lot less than yeah. 20. Oh, we've, known, we've known this right along, Alan. That's the problem with politics. You can't get prevailing wage. It costs us too much. Yep. It's a, so, it's a killer. So we've, been, we've been doing this forever. Ever. We can't get it. Yeah. So... My goal is to put this in front of the voters, let them decide, and let's put this to bed. It's it's too much. We've been kicking this down the road for. But sure. I I want it to go out household by household. I don't oh, want it to come up by town meeting because yeah. there's only a certain amount of people that go to town meeting. I want yeah. the survey to go to every household. I agree with that. It has to be a town town survey of some sort. We yep. can figure out how to do it. Yeah, we can do it. No no problem. Yeah. Okay. Move on. All right, so last thing and is a license fee discussion. So Jennifer, are you ready or are you falling asleep like the rest of us? I'm bailing, good night people. Good night, Alan. And I'm wide awake, I'm highly caffeinated, I'm super ready for this. <laughs> she looks wide awake. Um, so I did put on the onboard docs there are two documents. Um, I just added another one. Um, I was informed a little while ago that the first form of the 25% reduction wasn't showing up. So I created a new one during the meeting and I've put it up there. Um, it was not part of the original documents, but it is there now. It says reductions 25. Um, and I am going to say that this is not, this was done on the fly between taking notes the minutes and stuff so if there are mistakes this is not the document we will use going forward i just want to be clear um so i am i put that together i also included the revenues from the licenses for the last two years uh, for y'all to review um over the course of the last week as i was working on this other towns have come forward with what they're recommending um some towns are choosing to just pick specific licenses that for that affect businesses that were closed, like restaurants who were not open for so long and then they were allowed to open at 25%. Um, and then there's other towns that are doing this across the board presentation of 25% for everybody. And then there's another one and I kind of, um, I kind of like it, I, I wanna mention it. Uh, East Hampton is actually doing anything, they're doing it across the board, but the business has to request it. Um, and you know, I kind of, I kind of like that where the business is the one requesting it because not all of our businesses truly need the cut of the 25%. Um, and so we could allow them to, to choose their discretion, you know, do they really need that 25% or not? Um, but those are the numbers and, um, I leave it to you. I'm happy to answer any questions that y'all have, or if you want to table it. I don't have to send letters out until November 1st. Um, I just wanted to be able to give the businesses a heads up that this is coming their way. I think it's a great idea. I'd like to make a motion to accept the 25% and I also would like uh, a part of it to be after the letters have gone out to the businesses that it would be up to them to request that 25%. Um, I think, yes, it should be on their ownership. We're more than happy to help them. Um, but again, they have to request that from us. Second. After the business meeting yesterday and after talking to a lot of the managers and some of the business owners, I just, I feel across the board and just 
give them the benefit of the doubt for this one time for this year. All right. Any further discussion? No, there's still the bars aren't open. There's there's still some people that aren't open, and they're questioning if they're going to open at all. You know. Right. Hey, yep. Just a question, real quick question on John's point there for Jennifer is, do they have to pay for these now, or do, could, if they're not going to open for six months, can they pay in six months? It's next year's licensing, not now. It's next year's. Yeah, it's for next year. So for a liquor license, you have to um, sign and pay by um, November 30th or you lose your license. December um, 30th. No, November, November 30th. 30th. Okay. For the, for the liquor license, for the ABCC liquor licenses. All the others y'all control. control um and you can you can adjust that as you wish they're your licenses they are managed by mgl but y'all are y'all are the licensing scene commissioners so that's up to you the abcc fees must be paid and you must sign by november 30th um you know the young men's club hasn't been open the american legion has not been open um Interstate 91 has not been quarters, um, and, ends. Um, so there's, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some and that's not intentional, but there are some places that haven't been open and haven't been allowed to open. And, and maybe y'all want to consider something additional for the places that have not been able to open. But my thought was, is that the town does need, there's a reason that the licensing fees are collected. You can't waive them all, but 25% was showing that you recognize there's a problem, that you're taking active steps, and we're all gonna take a little bit of the hurt upon us as a town as well. Um, that's why I recommended 25. Motion on the table. All right, all those in favor. Aye. 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 No. And, uh, and, and, and Jennifer, I would just, I, I, and not to interrupt David, but I would just say, you know, I don't know. I just feel like if there's a restaurant that can't open, that's $3,500 due November 30th. Like, could they apply for an exception or some, you know, like, how can we work with people? I, I don't know if that's possible to say something, but, you know, I, I think it goes without saying that we all want to work with people and not impact them too much. That's why I said I, I wouldn't want to put these people through the extra paperwork, whereas right now with all the paperwork they're doing with the state and the federal governments to get their funding to keep them, keep them in business right now, never mind open. Well, if these places are not opening and they're not serving alcohol, it's the ABBC that is asking for payment by November 30th. If they don't feel they're going to open until the next year, they can also apply the amount is not going to change uh, at January 1st, so that it won't make a difference. If, they, if things change around and by January or February these places can open, then they can reapply and it doesn't take that long for them to get their license back. Has anybody so, talked to the state about extending this date because of the problems with COVID? So the state, the ABCC has been working, quite honestly, tirelessly, for um, the local restaurants and bars and things. Um, and I'll be careful saying this, but they have, they have shown a level of cooperation that is kind of unheard of for the ABCC. Um, they've really worked with the governor's office to extend the seating. Um, they've really been innovative about how they're willing to accept um, fencing and things like that. They really are working with them. Um, you know, we set the fees, and when I say we, I mean the town of Hadley votes at town meeting on the fees um, for these licenses. I mean, if you felt like you needed to lower them more, you could, but also, you know, the fees that are brought in are about $80,000 that come in every year. Um, we're going to take a cut with the 25% reduction, but, you know, those fees, those fees are collected for a purpose. And that's, you know, to fund the town. So 
I, I really have to leave it up to y'all in your hands, you know, what you want to do. I know that there have been places that have not been able to open. I know it's a hardship. Um, I don't think we can hold people's licenses if they don't sign and submit a payment. Um, I don't know how we do that. I can do some more research and bring it back to y'all again, if you would like. I, I would like you to reach out to the Beverage Commission and specifically say, given the COVID problem and some places not opening, can we have an extension on when they have to sign up for their next year's license? I will, I will do that. All right. So I think that's the, uh, David or Carolyn, do we need to do a motion to close the warrant since that was brought up that we haven't done that yet? So you can take that um, vote now if you wish. Can I get a motion to that effect, please? Make the motion to close the warrant. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, so the last thing, uh, Carolyn, do you have anything for an administrator's update um, before we check out for the evening? I do, I'll be really quick because I know everybody's tired, but I'm driving the longest, so. <laughs> um, just a, it's two and a half weeks since I started. Everything's going great so far. And I do want to just thank you all for um, having the wisdom to keep David on board. Um, I've learned so much from him. And um, I just I really appreciate that. That's made the transition go really well. Uh, definitely really impressed with the employees. The example, Jennifer being concerned about the businesses. And um, also, uh, Jennifer put on that business forum for the COVID listening session for local businesses. I thought it was well attended. And I think um, maybe a later date, she might be able to share what some of the input was from the businesses. Um, and uh, let's see, Mark Morris from Business West is writing a feature article on how communities are doing throughout the pandemic. And they interviewed David and I. I shared two and a half weeks experience of Hadley and my observations. Again, how the employees in the town really support each other but David gave a much better overview of the challenges um, that the community has been facing and what the future is looking like. Uh, the purchase and sales agreement for North Hadley Village Hall is in the buyer's hands with the historic preservation restriction, um, as well as the bell being kept in the town's possession. And financially to date, we continue to be on target uh, that David had set and um, I will hopefully be getting more updated numbers to update it um, through September. And I will share that information with you when that happens. Um, and finally, Linda and David have worked tirelessly um, to prepare for the S&P bond rating review, which is gonna take place on Friday. Um, and we continue to work on plans for the special town meeting. So that is my succinct short report. Okay. Anybody have anything quick as far as announcements? I do. I've been, I've been a little of miss uh, for a couple of weeks here. Um, I just need to do some condolences from the select board um, to the family of Dwight T. Touchette, um, who actually have lived in town for over 30 years. Um, quiet, quiet man. Uh, I wish to extend our condolences to his family. Uh, Richard Feidenkevich, uh, Amy's uh, father-in-law, uh, husband of Betty Feidenkevich, was a, who was our, was our school teacher. Uh, and Dick drove the van for the uh, Hadley Senior Center also. So condolences to Richard's family. Uh, Joseph Zura, on his condolences to his family. Um, we have uh, Joy Tudrin, who has passed away. Um, she lived here for a good number of years in town, and I actually worked with Joy for a number of years in utilization review and quality assurance at the hospital. Um, great lady, um, wife, mother, the whole, grandmother. She just was a good woman. Uh, Andrew P. Jekinowski, Andy. Uh, 
great write-up about Andy in the newspaper. There was one thing that they uh, did not say. And Andy was our chicken to go person during uh, little league and softball. Uh, when my kids were small, Andy had this special um, recipe that he had to putting on the chicken to go and he never shared that with anybody. So he took that with him. Um, but he was very much a very community person. Um, and he will be missed by his family. So condolences to Sue um, and, and uh, Andy's family. Uh, Edward Buckout has passed away um, from Hockenham, Merrill's husband. Uh, great Hadley people, historic people, um, certainly participated in many activities in town. So condolences to his family also. And then there was Mary By. She was a Hadley resident. She did live in Hatfield, but she does leave behind her brothers um, that live here in Hadley. She has a sister that lives down in Foxborough. Um, and I think one brother in Belchertown. So uh, condolences to Mary's family also. So we had quite a few people and it's uh, sad. But there's, also, there's also Ken and Judy Parker who lost a daughter. I think I did mention that at one point, didn't I? Maybe. No, has it been? Well, my goodness sakes. Yes. Um, I know I did send Judy and, and uh, Ken a card, uh, but condolences to the Parkers on the loss of their daughter also. That was quite a surprise for them. Um, anybody else that I missed at all? No. So uh, again, our select board sends out many condolences to our family of Hadley residents. I wanted to say thank you, Joyce, for uh, mentioning Richard, but I also wanted to say thank you to the Senior Center. Um, they, for um, getting my mother-in-law, they, they picked her up to bring her to the funeral. She hadn't been out in over a year um, out of the house because she's housebound, but oh. since yeah, since she is uh, Rick Dick um, was part of the senior center um, driver, she they helped out a lot. They were wonderful. The senior center was wonderful, and thank oh. you. Oh, that's really nice. Thank you for sharing that, Amy. Appreciate it. I think of Betty often. She was great, and so wasn't Dick. They were a nice couple. Thank you. Uh, um. Thank the Legion for their chicken to go. Everything was excellent. Yeah. On the lighter side here, uh, looks like they had a good turnout. 530 dinners, John. And really, that's what they put out, huh? Wow. Yeah, that's what they put out. And they could have done more, but that's the number that they cooked and sold. So that was good. I'd like to make a public announcement, if I can, that there will be another townwide flu clinic at the Senior Center on October 21st. You need to call and make a reservation for a time to get your flu shot. This is not just for seniors, it's anyone in the town now. Jane, are you offering the uh, high resistant flu shot for people of uh, elders? I only announce things, Walgreens in charge. Okay, because there are certain, um, there's the regular flu shot and then there's the uh, high risk flu shots for people, the elder peoples. So I, I, you know, that's one of the things that people might be asking. So um, I guess that's up to Walgreens. I'll mention it to Violet and she can follow up on it. Okay, thanks Jane, appreciate it. Walgreens did uh, offer the high grade as well when we went for our flu shots. Okay, good. Nice to know. Thank you. Okay, if no one has any more announcements, I can get a motion to adjourn, please. Motion to adjourn. Oh, wait, hold on. Jennifer's waving her hands. Stop. Bye, I'm Jennifer. sorry. Bye. Um, I, have, <clears throat> I have an item that's unforeseen. I'm so sorry. Um, Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion School is asking to use the common for a cross country race on October 13th. Um, Hopkins Academy will not be using it on that day. We have nothing else scheduled. Um, they have provided an application and insurance. Um, they submitted them all yesterday afternoon, and I received the insurance this morning. Um, it's a race between Hop or 
Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion School and St. Mary's. Those are the two schools and they'll abide by any conditions that you put forth, um, but they are asking for permission. And I'm so sorry, I forgot. Uh, get assuming they're not crossing Route 9, they'll stay on one half or the other. That is correct. They're going to do exactly what Hopkins does. Um, I guess the, Eric Sudnick sort of told them about it's a good route and it's easy to find. Okay, so we did clarify that other date in October for Hopkins? We didn't. I'm having a lot of trouble with my computer this evening and with board docs. Um, and I'm assuming y'all can understand me better now that I'm not picking up quite as much, but I'm having I'm having a little bit of internet trouble here and accessing everything. So I will give you the other date, but it is three dates in October. Uh -huh. But it's, I can't I can't pull it off the top of my head and I can't open the document on board docs. So as long as it doesn't have any conflict, I don't have a problem with Pioneer Valley Immersion School using the town uh, common as long as it is not in conflict with Hopkins Academy. It, it wouldn't be because Eric Sugnick wouldn't have told them about it if it was going to. Okay. All right. Again, so motion. moved. Right. So moved. Second. All right. All right. We'll move discussion. All those in favor. Aye. 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 All right. Now, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right. Second. All right. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Aye.